Simon and Schuster Audio presents Star Trek First Contact by J.M. Dillard. Read by Gates McFadden. Apathy. That was the greater evil. Picard knew that an indifferent foe is more to be feared than one whose heart burns with honest hate. Apathy. It stretched out before him in infinite rows of face after flesh and metal face in a gray metal sea that knew no beauty, no appreciation of life. Only the singular voice of the collective. He stood, the only living spot of color in a vast chamber, surrounded by thousands of cells. In each cell, an upright Borg drone slept dreamlessly. Insects might be mindless, but not soulless. The Borg were both. And it was that fact which made him struggle when they pinned him down and slammed his head against the surgical table. As he stared up at his approaching fate, a silvery, needle-sharp probe descending directly toward his eye, he thought... This is a foe I can never engage, for they will never care enough to return my hate. In the midst of his struggle, an image came to him, a mouth, bloodless and borg. And he heard not the thunderous voice of the collective, but that of a woman. Hello, cutest. He shuddered at the sound of his own voice, the voice of the borg. I am Locutus of Borg. Resistance is futile. At the very instant the probe pierced his eye, his eye, he screamed, not so much with pain as with pure rage at the enemy who did not care enough to hate. With a lurch to find himself sitting on his couch in the ready room. He put a hand to his sweat-dampened forehead, dismayed that he had dozed off while on duty, and still alarmed by the intensity of the nightmare. He hastened to the small adjacent restroom and leaned low over the sink. Cold water on his face, again and again, washing away all traces of panic, until his breathing slowed, and he at last dared rise to face his mirrored reflection. Locutus. Abruptly, he recalled the image of the ghost pale lips seductively uttering his Borg name. Try though he might, he could not remember the face attached to that mouth. As he stared into the mirror, a muscle just above his jaw spasmed, as though someone had plunged a needle from the inside of his mouth outwards through his cheek. It was accompanied by an odd sound that seemed to emanate from within Picard's own head. Impossible, of course. Just tension brought on by the stress of the dream. It would pass. But as he stood over the sink, the pain intensified, and the muscle began to writhe continuously. When the last and sharpest burst of agony came, he gazed at his twitching cheek. The flesh trembled, then stretched out as if he were pressing hard from the inside with his tongue. At last, the muscle tore and the skin burst. He stared in horrified fascination as darkly gleaming metal, slick with his own blood, emerged from within him. A Borg servo. It rotated while Picard descended into mindless panic. Picard awoke, gasping on his own couch and abruptly sat up. He put a hand to his cheek to feel for the servo before realizing that he had awakened again from a nightmare. Truly awakened. The couch and his arms beneath him were solid, real. The noise, too, was real. He rose from the couch and moved to the terminal and composed himself before tapping a control. A message coalesced on the screen. Incoming transmission. Starfleet command to Captain J.L. Picard, USS Enterprise, NCC-1701-E. Command authorization required. Authorization. Picard. 47 Alpha Tango. The image on the screen faded at once and was replaced by the image of Admiral Hayes at Starfleet Headquarters. Catch you at a bad time, Jean-Luc? No, of course not, sir. Hayes clearly did not believe the captain's reply, but the urgency of his message kept him from pursuing the matter. I've just received a disturbing report from Deep Space Five. Long-range sensors have picked up... 
Picard interrupted. I know. The Borg. Surrounded by his senior crew, Picard sat at the conference table in the observation lounge of the new Enterprise. The room was an elegant improvement over its predecessor. Its most striking feature was a multitude of windows opening on to a star-littered indigo. A stunning sight. But Picard could only think, All those suns, and orbiting them, how many habitable planets? And of those planets, how many life forms assimilated by the Borg? How many cultures forever lost over the millennia? And how soon shall we join them? Six months earlier, he had sat in this room and stared up at the bulkhead, where models of all the Enterprise's previous incarnations, A through D, hung. He had already worked through his lingering sense of loss at his previous ship's destruction. The Enterprise D was irretrievably gone, but her spirit remained, permeating every atom, every cell of this vessel and her crew. Now Picard looked at his surroundings and dared not allow himself to feel attachment. This was merely another ship that might be lost. He drew his attention back to his staff. Data, Riker, Troy, and Beverly. The faces were the same, but they now wore the new uniforms. Black, softened only by an inset at the shoulder and collarbone of dark gray. The effect was flattering, but a bit severe, and perhaps appropriate for the moment, given the devastating nature of the announcement he had just made. After his brief, blunt statement that the Borg had reappeared, expressions grew somber, and five pairs of anxious eyes focused upon him. The fifth pair of eyes belonged to Geordi LaForge, who, like the Enterprise E, seemed familiar yet changed. LaForge's visor had been replaced a short time before by electronic ocular implants, and Picard still felt mildly disconcerted every time he looked into his chief engineer's large eyes with their dizzyingly intricate geometric designs traced in black on starkly blue irises. Riker came to the point quickly. How many ships? One. And it's on a direct course for Earth. It will cross the Federation border in less than an hour. Admiral Hayes has begun mobilizing a fleet in the Typhon sector. He hopes to stop the Borg before they reach Earth. Data, whose pale golden face reflected the concern he felt, courtesy of his activated emotion chip, interjected, At maximum warp, it will take us three hours, twenty-five minutes to reach... Picard swiveled in his chair to face the android. We're not going. Riker leaned forward, his dark eyebrows arching upward. What do you mean we're not going? Picard averted his gaze and stared out at the blurring stars. Our orders are to patrol the neutral zone in case the Romulans try to take advantage of the situation. Deanna Troy was frankly disbelieving. The Romulans? Data spoke up immediately. Captain... There has been no unusual activity along the Romulan border for the past nine months. It seems highly unlikely that they would choose this moment to start a conflict. Beverly rested both elbows on the table. Maybe Starfleet feels we haven't had enough shakedown time. Perhaps she believed it, perhaps not. For Picard shot her a glance, and she at once lowered her gaze, as if in admission there might be another, deeper reason Starfleet had ordered the Enterprise E to stay away, but she was too loyal to utter it. LaForge dismissed Crusher's argument with a wave of his hand. We've been in space for six months. We're ready. The Enterprise-E is the most advanced starship in the fleet. We should be in the front lines. If Geordi suspected the same reason Beverly did, he did not show it. Neither did Troy or Data. Riker's expression remained inscrutable. Picard worked to keep his own outrage from showing, and not particularly succeeding. I've voiced all these concerns to Starfleet Command. Their orders stand. Number one, set course for the neutral zone. Picard rose, then exited swiftly, before the others saw his anger and shame. At the entrance to the ready room, Will Riker paused, pad in hand. He had performed the distasteful task assigned him as second in command. 
The Enterprise E now sailed a respectful distance from the neutral zone's border. The first scan had been completed, and it fell to Riker to present the results to the captain. Almost a full day had passed since Picard's stunning announcement that the Borg were headed toward Earth. The crew members, himself included, were undeniably frustrated, restless, even angry at Starfleet's refusal to let them be of real service. How much more offended and furious was Picard, who had once been captured by the Borg and used to kill his own people? Picard's greatest opportunity for expiation, and the Enterprise crew's greatest opportunity to avenge their captain's suffering, had arrived, and Starfleet denied him and them that chance. Will drew a breath and stepped forward. From the ready room, a blast of dark, thunderous music and anguished voices assaulted him. A half-full teacup on the captain's desk rattled in its saucer. Picard stood staring out at the stars, his back to the door. Rage seemed to emanate from his body into the air, riding upon each blaring, furious note. Picard turned to face his second-in-command. Without a word or a change in his taut expression, he tapped a control on his console. What do you have, number one? Riker handed him the pad. We finished our first sensor sweep of the neutral zone. As the captain scanned the readout, his lips thinned to a grim line. Fascinating. Twenty particles of space dust per cubic meter, fifty-two ultraviolet radiation spikes, and a class two comet. He tossed the pad onto his desk. This is certainly worthy of our time. Captain, I know how you feel. The captain's hazel eyes narrowed and stared deep into Riker's with a fury and intensity that would have made any less loyal or determined friend and officer flinch and turn away in apology. Actually, I doubt very much that you know how I feel. Though Picard eyed him squarely, the focus of the captain's gaze seemed beyond him, as if it were fixed fast upon ghosts from another time. The flaming hull of the starship Melbourne, the Saratoga, the Gage. Thirty-seven more starships and tens of thousands of lives aboard them were lost at Wolf 359 in the battle against the Borg. Thanks to the strategic knowledge of Locutus's human half, Captain Jean-Luc Picard. Riker took a step forward, his tone pointed. Captain, why are we out here chasing comets? Let's just say that Starfleet has every confidence in the Enterprise and her crew, but they're not so sure about her captain. They believe a man who was once captured by the Borg and assimilated should not be put in a situation where he would face them again. To do so would be to introduce an unstable element into a critical situation. That's crazy, Captain. Your experience with the Borg makes you the perfect man to lead this fight. Picard's expression darkened. Admiral Hayes disagrees. Bridge to Captain Picard. Go ahead, Counselor. We've just received word from Starfleet Command. They've engaged the Borg. Picard strode onto the bridge and noted that everything aboard the Enterprise E, including the situation that now confronted him and his crew, was strange yet familiar. Strange in that the captain's chair was now elevated above the rest to provide a better overview of the entire bridge. Familiar in that once again, the Enterprise crew anticipated a nightmarish battle with the Borg. Yet so unutterably strange that they should not be permitted to be part of it. Picard could not help but note the lines of tension etched on each officer's expression. The expression closest to conveying real calm belonged to Lieutenant Hawk at Khan, whose unflappable direct personality reminded the captain of Will Rikers, although Hawk was younger, clean-shaven, and lean to the point of wiriness. Of course, Hawk had not been aboard the Enterprise D when her captain had been captured by the Borg. He had never heard Locutus speak, nor witnessed the fiery destruction of 40 of Starfleet's finest warships. Impossible to understand the horror of the Borg unless one had met them in battle, or worse, in their own hive. Hawk's confidence sprang from ignorance, and the captain did not look forward to seeing him lose either. Commander Data, put Starfleet subspace frequency 1486 on audio. Flagship to Endeavor, stand by to engage at grid 815. Defiant and Bozeman, fall back to mobile position 1. 
At the mention of the Defiant, Troy grew concerned. All of them shared a single unspoken thought. Worf. Acknowledged, flagship. We have it in visual range. We see it. A Borg cube on course zero, mark 215. Speed, warp 9.8. We are the Borg. Lower your shields and surrender your ships. We will add your biological and technological distinctiveness to our own. Your culture will adapt to service us. Resistance is futile. We are the Borg. Picard felt his flesh prickle. He stared out at the speechless stars on the main view screen and thought, How many planets? At the same time, an ominous realization came to him. He had known they were going to speak just then, hadn't he? Even before they had uttered a sound, he had known the precise second they were going to speak. All units, open fire. Remodulate shield. We're losing power. Warp core breach. All hands, abandon ship. This is the flagship. They've broken through the defense perimeter. They're heading toward Earth. Pursuit course, break off the attack. The card caught Data's gaze and sliced a hand through the air. The transmission ceased at once. In any other situation, Picard would have asked the senior bridge crew to accompany him to the ready room, where he would have sought opinions and advice. After all, the wisest course was to consult cooler heads than his own. At the moment, he didn't give a damn. He leaned toward the car. Lieutenant Hawk, set course for Earth. Maximum warp. Picard shot a brief glance at an approving Will Riker before turning to address his crew. I am about to commit a direct violation of our order. Any of you who wish to object, do so now and I'll note it in my log. Data swiveled to face the captain. I think I speak for everyone here, sir, when I say to help with our orders. Picard permitted himself a small, bitter smile. Then red alert. All hands to battle station. As crew members scrambled to their stations, Picard told himself, I'm probably taking all of these people to their deaths and myself to my own, if all of us are lucky. And if we are not, a responsible fear. But he would rather live with it for the time being than surrender without a fight to the evil of mindless apathy. So he settled back into his chair and ordered Hawk, Engage. Aboard the Defiance Bridge, Lieutenant Commander Worf sat staring at the view screen's display of the monstrous and ungainly Borg Cube surrounded by a dozen tiny starships. Dazzling bursts of phaser fire lit up the surrounding blackness, leaving scorch marks on the Borg Cube's dull pewter hull. Worf watched the effects of his recently ordered photon blasts with a grim warrior's smile of satisfaction. The hull of the massive Borg vessel was as pockmarked as an unsheltered moon. But his satisfaction was short-lived. The cube, a conglomeration of external metal tubing, wiring, and conduits that looked as if its builders had decided to simply turn the vessel inside out, exposing its bowels to space, shuddered briefly at the blast, then immediately struck back at the flagship, which had had the honor of first opening fire on the cube. A burst of five fire-bright torpedoes slipped from the cube. The flagship's defenses were weakening, as were the Defiance. Worf glanced over his shoulder at Khan to Lieutenant Kizzlebash, a lean human female with a sculpted angular face. Evasive maneuver. As a moving target, the starship Defiant was less likely to be hit. But Worf harbored no false hopes about his chances of surviving the battle. Such a death would be supremely honorable. He had long ago decided, during his first look at Picard as the Borg drone Locutus, that he would indeed die rather than submit to the crime against freedom called assimilation. He thought that it was unfair that Picard was not here to redress the wrong done him. When the Defiant first arrived at the battlefront, Worf had asked Starfleet Command why the new Enterprise had not appeared and was informed curtly that she was patrolling the Romulan border. It seemed to him an outrage to keep Picard from an act of redemption and the Enterprise E from providing aid to those who desperately needed her now. Worf watched the viewscreen as the Defiant sailed in a swift arc. 
the Borg vessel lay dead ahead, while at two o'clock the flagship shuddered, its forward hull and one nacelle illumined by a flood of eye-searing deadly light. Two of the blasts had already struck hull. Abruptly, the brightness dimmed. Worf knew that fire was immediately extinguished in the vacuum of space. But beneath that blackened hull were dull glimmers of swift-moving redness. The oxygen-laden decks where people were being burned alive. The third torpedo sliced into the already weakened hull. The fourth hammered the crippled nacelle, whose surface crumbled and emitted the shocking orange flare that heralded a warp core breach. The final torpedo pierced the wounded starship with a writhing corona of light, whose brightness was only increased by the sudden nova intense eruption from the warp core nacelle. The sudden nova intense eruption sent darkening bits of shrapnel hurtling past the Defiant into the breathless void. Worf kept his gaze fixed on the viewscreen for another timeless instant. A fresh barrage of torpedoes birthed from the Borg ship's underbelly was now streaking directly toward his vessel, his crew. The sight made him bare his teeth. Fire phases! Worf did not have the pleasure of seeing the toll his response took on the Borg cube. The first blast hit, and the Defiant pitched hard astern, throwing Worf back against his chair. The second blast rendered all hope of communication with his bridge crew impossible. Officers were flung from their stations onto the deck. The Khan erupted in multicolored fireworks. Sharp bits of debris flew past Worf's face, stung his skin as he pitched forward against the deck. The ship was beginning to come apart. The air surrounding him became acrid with smoke. The Defiant lurched upward and back, the impact lifting Worf off his feet and slamming his cheek against the console again. He could feel warm, damp blood trickling down his face, but the warrior's fury in his heart obliterated all pain, all fear, and made him rise to his feet. To his relief, he did not hear the computer's urgent voice warning of an imminent warp core breach. But neither did he hear the expected drone of voices reporting the extent of the damage. Report. Kizilbash pulled herself up into her chair. Main power is offline. We've lost shields and our weapons are gone. Worf paused the length of a single breath. No more. Then perhaps today is a good day to die. Ramming speed. Kizilbash moved toward the Khan, prepared to comply. But something she saw there made her glance up at her commander. Sir, there's another starship coming in. It's the Enterprise. In the flashing crimson glow of the red alert, Picard sat in his new captain's chair and watched as the Enterprise E's powerful phasers found their target the scarred, blackened surface of the Borg cube. The attack immediately drew the enemy's fire away from the crippled warship. The Borg, in turn, unleashed a retaliatory barrage that the new Enterprise absorbed with the faintest of shudders. Riker glanced up from his station. The Defiant is losing life support. Picard nodded. Bridge to transporter room three. Beam the Defiant survivors aboard. Data, what's the status on the Borg cube? It has sustained heavy damage on its outer hull. I am reading fluctuations in their power grid. In the millisecond before the android replied, the card realized that he inexplicably knew the information he had requested, for his question had already been answered by a whisper in his own head. Critical damage to shield at power sector 111. All drones coordinate repair immediately. They were wounded. They were vulnerable, and he knew beyond all reason the precise spot. He wheeled toward Riker. Number one, open a channel to the other Starfleet vessels. Picard moved swiftly to Data's console and fingered the weapons control while the android watched in frank amazement. By then, the channel to the remaining warships was open. This is Captain Picard of the Enterprise. I'm taking command of the fleet. Target every weapon you have on the following coordinates and fire on my command. Data stared down at the coordinates Picard had just entered. Captain, the coordinates you have indicated do not appear to be a vital system. Trust me, Data. 
Picard stared straight ahead at the view screen, already seeing in his mind's eye the Borg's dazzling fate. Riker reported behind him. The fleet's ready. Picard gave the order to the remaining starships. Fire. The Borg cube dissolved into hurtling debris beneath the combined firepower of the Federation vessels. Oddly, the sight brought Picard a little comfort. A mystifying reaction until he saw, emerging from the flying dust and shrapnel, a smaller vessel. Not a cube, but a sphere with the same Borg design of exposed circuitry and tubing. The sphere flew past the assembled starships directly toward Earth. The card returned to his chair. Pursuit course. Engage. So he was still tied, to some degree, to the Borg. Had Starfleet been right? Would this make him a danger to those he wished to protect? Yet, the connection had not been two-way. The Borg had clearly not known he was about to destroy their ship. Or had they? Deanna Troy clearly sensed his turmoil. Her black eyes narrowed with concern, but before she could speak, the turbolift doors opened to reveal Dr. Crusher, and behind her, Lieutenant Commander Worf. The Klingon's uniform was torn and bloodied, his deep brown face further darkened by soot. Picard did not smile at him, the situation was too grim for that. Welcome to the Enterprise E, Mr. Worf. Thank you, sir. The Defiant? Adrift, but salvageable. Riker smiled. Tough little ship. Worf snarled, revealing a glimpse of particularly fearsome-looking yellowed teeth. Little? Riker rightly interpreted the display as good-humored. Picard noted how much the bridge crew had missed the Klingon. We could use some help at tactical, Worf. Troy and Data were both grinning broadly at Worf, but Picard could not smile, not yet. Though he no longer heard the voice of the Borg, he could sense them, and knew defeat was too near, as near as the planet Earth. All too soon, the Enterprise viewscreen revealed the marble blue-white sphere of Earth and a second, smaller, more sinister sphere that dove swiftly toward her. Data scowled at his monitor. Captain, sensors show high concentrations of tachyons and chronometric particles emanating from the sphere. The Borg vessel began to glow scarlet in the upper reaches of the Earth's atmosphere. Picard suddenly knew that he had no need to consult readouts. They're creating a temporal vortex. Riker looked on with horror. Time travel. Picard stared along with his stunned crew as, ahead of the Borg sphere, a tunnel of blazing, writhing energy and light opened. The sphere flew directly into the heart of the brilliant maelstrom, displacing a wave of crackling energy that surged outward, enveloping the Enterprise. The deck beneath Picard's feet convulsed. Riker shouted, we're caught in some kind of temporal wake. Worf called from tactical. Captain, the Earth. On the screen, the energy wake had begun to dissipate, revealing the Earth. It had changed. The atmosphere was now storm-swirled, turbulent, dark. Picard gazed again at the glowing vortex, still open, and within, the sapphire jewel of the true Earth. Life signs data? Data consulted his console. Population, approximately nine billion. All Borg. Troy turned to Picard. But how? They must have done it in the past. They went back and assimilated Earth, changed history. Dr. Crusher looked puzzled. But if they changed history, why are we still here? Data gave the answer. The temporal wake must have protected us from changes in the timeline. Data glanced down at his console. The vortex is collapsing. Picard hesitated, not a heartbeat. Data, hold your course. We have to follow them back. Repair whatever damage they've done. In silence, the Enterprise E hurtled straight ahead into the blinding brilliance of the past.
The air was close in the old crash and burn, stale and unpleasant, filled with the scent of sour sweat, moonshine and smoke. It was the smell, Lily decided, that had caused her headache. That and the two shots of brain-numbing, vile-tasting swill that passed for the local liquor, and the fact that Zeph had had ten shots and was beginning to slur again. Whatever it was, she had grown suddenly furious, seized Zeph's arm and pulled him off his bar stool and out of the tattered olive drab tent into the freezing April night. She filled her lungs with fresh air. The first breath was bracing, the second bitterly cold. Zeph pleaded, Lily, come on. He was in one of his manic moods tonight, a rather charming one. His cheeks flushed bright pink from liquor and cold. He looked like a boy instead of a worn 50-year-old man. Lily knew it wasn't just the booze, it was the excitement, the anticipation of tomorrow. We're celebrating, Lily, remember? We can celebrate when it's over. She made her way cautiously around the larger mud puddles, which were capped by a layer of frosted ice. Zeph followed alongside, arms out, pleading. Come on, Lily, one more round. You've had enough. I'm not riding that thing tomorrow with a drunken pilot. As she spoke, she wondered why she was so angry about the upcoming launch. Because it might not work. That's why. Because, for the first time in ten years, something had come along that made her dare hope. It was hard after ten years to remember much about life before the war, but she couldn't forget the university. All the math and physics classes that she secretly adored while complaining about them. They simply went away, ended in a moment of political insanity when she was twenty. No more dream of being an engineer. When it became clear that war was imminent, the university president sent them all home, and she stepped through the old doorway, luggage in hand, just in time to hear her dad's voice coming from the family room. That's it. It started. Lily's sister, Denise, had been living with her husband and kids in D.C., ground zero. Washington and three surrounding states had been blown off the map. Their house was left standing, but the growing radiation levels carried on the wind forced them to leave most everything behind. So they packed up the ground car and roamed like nomads, with Dad's old camping gear looking for clean ground. What they took with them was stolen, of course, by road thieves with guns. She wound up stealing a gun in order to protect her parents. She'd even shot a total of five men and one woman in that first awful year. The car ran out of juice within a month's time. They'd had to abandon it, and head out on foot, finally winding up at a horrifically crowded KOA campground. The first night at the KOA, Maud laid down in a borrowed tent and said, Lily, I think I have cancer. She showed her the lump. Her ma died of cancer, a disease you weren't supposed to have to fear anymore. But now you had to be afraid of everything again. Soon after, her dad took to drink. She let it go, until the night he used her pistol to kill himself. For a long time after, why she kept going, she couldn't say, except that maybe she was looking for something, and she found it the night she met Zeph. She had finally headed far north to Montana. It was one of the cleanest places around. She'd wandered into the local bar, the Crash and Burn, an old army tent, really, set with a few tables, a rickety bar, and an honest-to-God jukebox and she'd sat right down beside Zeph Cochran. He was in one of his life-of-the-party moods. To say he charmed the socks off her was putting it mildly. Within five minutes, he'd learned her name and trade and history, and propositioned her. He had a get-rich-quick scheme, he told her, and she could be part of it. Lily smiled. Yeah, right. Find another sucker, white boy. No, no, he said. He had come here to Montana because of the old missile silos. He was a physicist, working on a project. Would she come to his place? There was something there he wanted to show her. And before she knew it, she was sitting cross-legged across from him on the cold dirt floor of his hut, listening to him explain that he needed certain mechanical parts to build a spaceship. She leapt up to leave. Zeph gently caught her hand. Damn it, Lily, help me. I can't do this alone. Here, let me show you. He'd named his ship the Phoenix. 
He grabbed a handful of blueprints off the cabinet, spread them out on the ground. He spoke swiftly, happily, of how the nuclear core contained in an old warhead could be harnessed for something he called a warp engine. She actually did understand much of what he told her, and it made frighteningly good sense. Warp drive. Back at the university, they had called it hyperspace, and it was only an intangible dream. Light years reduced to a day's travel, the stars no longer impossibly distant. Lily, I have a deal with some Indonesians. They see the potential and know it'll take some time, but they're willing to pay millions. She rubbed her freezing arms. Indonesia, huh? Is it warm there? So, for the next few years, they played a little game with each other. He pretended to be nothing more than a hard-bitten entrepreneur desperate to strike it rich, while she pretended to be nothing more than a hard-bitten thief, hungry for a piece of the action. Or so she reminded herself every time she dragged him from the crash and burn and tucked him into his own bed when he was too drunk to find his way home. Affection had nothing to do with it. She was merely taking care of her investment in the future. Beside her, Zeph grunted, bringing her back into the present to the frozen mud and biting air. Would it really happen? Would they be up there making history tomorrow as the first two people to travel using warp drive? And would the Indonesians really pay them all that money? What would it be like to have a solidly constructed house with real running water? Her gaze grew unfocused, but not enough to miss a fantastically swift-moving disk of light amid the stars. She touched Zeph's arm. What the hell is that? He glanced up, squinting hard to keep from seeing double. That, my dear, is the constellation Leo. No, that. Zeph lifted his face toward the sky and finally saw it. His faint, inebriated grin vanished. She saw two bright streaks emerging from the shining disk. For half a heartbeat's pause, both of them stood frozen with fearful puzzlement, trying to understand the distant thunder. Then the drab world around Lily vanished, replaced by a yellow-white burst of blinding brilliance, as if she had stepped inside a star. For a second or two, she knew nothing but blindness, deafness. Slowly, her vision began to return. She could hear the sound of other blasts ripping through the settlement. Beneath her belly, the cold, muddy ground shuddered continuously. Some yards distant, Zeph scrambled on his hands and knees away from a great smoking crater, all that remained of several nearby Quonset huts and tents. There had been people in them, a couple of families, maybe 25, 30 victims inside. Lily pushed herself up, dashed out into the street, pulled Zeph to his feet. The two of them dove again for cover while more dazzling streaks of light rained down from the heavens. Beside her, Zeph rolled his eyes skyward and in them saw reflected the blazing bolts and the death of all their dreams. She screamed in his ear, You think it's the Econ? It was the only thing that made sense. The Eastern Coalition must have somehow recovered, rebuilt, and were determined to wipe out what small pieces of North, Central, and South Am remained. She almost sobbed with pure rage at the cruelty of it all. Zeph's expression was one of irony and defeat. They couldn't have waited another day. Abruptly, he dragged her toward the crash and burn. For an instant, she was tempted to join him, to go get blindingly drunk and die. The whole freaking world had gone insane again, and there was no point in postponing death. The phoenix was probably ashes and would never rise, but better to die trying. The Enterprise had finally stopped shaking, as if trying to tear herself apart. Jean-Luc Picard leaned forward in his chair and saw that the earth on the view screen was most definitely blue. He turned toward his second-in-command. Report. Riker glanced down at his console. Shields are down. Long-range sensors are offline. Main power's holding. Despite his operative emotion chip, Data had reoriented himself. According to our astrometric readings, we are in the mid-21st century. 
From the radioactive isotopes in the atmosphere, I would estimate we have arrived approximately 10 years after the Third World War. Picard looked up at the screen to see the Borg sphere firing a rapid volley of photon blasts down at one particular target on the unprotected planet. Mr. Worf, quantum torpedoes, fire. Within two seconds, a burst of five torpedoes struck the small sphere. The craft had been unshielded because the Borg had anticipated no space-borne enemies in the past. The sphere's interior began to glow, to flash, from a series of internal explosions. The deck beneath Picard rocked briefly. They were firing at the surface. Where? Riker rose and moved to a distant console. Western Hemisphere, North American continent. Looks like some sort of missile complex in central Montana. The location triggered a mental alarm in Picard. He wheeled toward Data. The date. I need to know the exact date. Data consulted his readout. The date is April 6th. 2063. Picard and Riker exchanged a swift look that spoke of mingled horror and triumph. That's one day before first contact. That's what they came here to do. Stop first contact. The missile complex the Borg attacked is where Zephram Cochran is building his warp ship. How much damage did they do? Riker shook his head. Can't tell. Long range sensors are still offline. We have to go down there. Find out what happened. Data, Beverly, you're with me. Have a security team meet me in transporter room three. 21st century civilian clothes. Number one, you have the bridge. The blasts had stopped by the time Lily made it to the stairs leading down to the silo. The entire area surrounding it was gouged with smoking craters that smelled of ozone. Thank God it wasn't a direct hit. But there were so many peripheral ones that there had to be damage down below. And if the Phoenix had been spared, it would be the most major of miracles. And if there had been any harm done to the blast door, and to the metal shielding on any of a dozen components that were radioactively hot, Lily squared her small shoulders, walked through the slowly opening silo door, and at the sight of what lay within the outer control room, sighed. Oh, God. Freshly materialized, Picard drew in a breath and savored the stinging cold of a spring Montana night. In front of him, and the away team of Data Crusher and four guards, was Zephram Cochran's famous missile silo, situated at the foot of the grim, poverty-stricken mountainside settlement that was so commonplace in the first decade after the Third World War. The horror came from the sight of the great smoldering craters that surrounded the silo. Beneath the scarred and muddy earth, Cochran might already be dead. For an instant, the seven of them hesitated at the massive concrete door, covering the actual shaft where the original missile had lain. No obvious means of entry there. Picard scanned the broken, uneven, sometimes smoking ground, and at last spied behind a dirt mound a metal staircase leading downward. He signaled to his team, and they proceeded underground to what had been the original control room, where bored soldiers had sat awaiting a launch order that never came, because their superiors died in the first swift nuclear attack. Now the control room ceiling was partially collapsed, most of the equipment crushed beneath chunks of concrete and fallen beams. In the ghostly shadows, crushed to death beneath one of the beams, lay the sprawled corpse of a dark-haired man. He lay atop the corpse of a woman. Apparently his last act had been to shelter her. In another corner of the room, Another man had been apparently sitting in a chair at the console and had been thrown backward when the ceiling caved in on him. Crusher scanned them all, then looked at Picard. They're all dead. He nodded, grim. See if any of them's Cochrane. Data, let's check on the warp ship. The silo was of such historical significance that calling up a detailed map of it on the Enterprise E's computers presented no problem. Picard had visited it in the 23rd century, and it had been a clean, well-lit, cheerful shrine. Seeing it now, covered with dust and smoking soot and bloodied corpses, 
brought the reality home. This was where Cochrane had existed, in a violent, hostile past. No one hailed him then as the genius he was. No one believed that the very thing that had destroyed the Earth would become her salvation. Silently, Picard made a solemn promise to Zephram Cochrane, be he living or dead. The Phoenix had risen from the ashes of such horror, and he, Picard, would not permit her descendants to perish in another holocaust or to live without hope. With Data beside him, he headed out into the corridor that led directly to the warp ship. Moments earlier, Lily had staggered through the same control room. John and Grace Weir Quintana and Marcus Lee were dead. As best she could figure, her neighbors had been out strolling that night and had ducked into the nearby silo when the bombs came, figuring that it offered the best protection. Who could have known this spot would have been hit hardest? The minute she saw the collapsed ceiling and the crushed consoles, any hope she'd had for the warp ship's launch died. Zeph's rebuilt console that normally displayed a schematic of the ship and warned of leakage or malfunction had gone distressingly dark. The corridor that led toward the missile chamber itself was less damaged and thus more easily navigable. Lily made her way quickly to the lead blast door, still sealed, still protecting her from whatever might lie inside. With the computer destroyed, there was simply no way to know whether the inner chamber was hot. Zeph kept a couple of Geiger counters in the missile chamber, but they were impossible to retrieve. To know whether the chamber was hot, she would have to enter it. She drew a breath and stepped forward. When the great leaden door had slid open, she released all the air in her lungs with a single gusting sigh. If there was a leak, she was already a dead woman. Lily stood on the highest catwalk, the one that led to the ship's cockpit in the vast chamber's heart. Beneath, Two more floors of metal scaffolding led to the engineering and reactor levels on the Phoenix. There was damage, yes, but perhaps not fatal. Lily ran across the trembling catwalk to the cockpit. She slipped into the pilot's chair and glanced down at the control panel. Dark. She opened a compartment and retrieved a flashlight. She aimed the flashlight at the cockpit ceiling and examined it for damage. What she saw made her gasp. Directly over the right passenger seat, the fuselage had completely buckled, leaving a great smoldering wound that had spilled a mound of blackened cinders and pulverized concrete into the chair. Worse, a jagged scorch mark indicated the trail of the blast, which had seared the back of the co-pilot's seat, then split open the small hatch leading down to the engine. She wasted no time following the path of the damage. By the time she arrived at the entrance to the claustrophobically small engine room, she was simultaneously shivering, sweating, and queasy. A sweep of the flashlight revealed that a conduit in the coolant system had ruptured. An easy fix. Abruptly, a wave of dizziness swept over her. Just anxiety in the rotten air, she told herself. A sweep of the flashlight revealed that the powerful bolt had slashed its way across the engine room. It ended in a deep gouge in the lead deck, that served as the major shield that protected the rest of the ship from the core reactors in the nacelles. It was as though someone had known what Zeph was doing down here and had intentionally targeted the Phoenix. Luckily, the engines themselves were untouched, as was the lead casing. There would be repairs and a delay, but the Phoenix would launch after all. Lily stripped off a glove and lowered herself to a squat, using flashlight, fingertips, and eyes to examine the encased tubing down to the throttle complex. Instinctively, she reached around the casing until her hand rested between the bulkhead and the throttle complex, then ran her fingertips over the startlingly hot metal surface. She cursed, dropped her flashlight, and snatched her hand away. Her already blistering fingers were coated with fine gray ash. The valve. The valve to the warp cores must have somehow been displaced. There's a leak. The dark brown skin of her hand turned slowly to scarlet. A burn caused by direct exposure to the radiation streaming from the core. She pitched forward onto her hands and knees and vomited. What? Bastards. 
the econ had to make sure every single ragged bit of the planet was blown to hell. Lily pushed open the emergency hatch and staggered out onto the catwalk next to the engine room. She was a walking dead woman, but before she passed out, she intended to accomplish two things. Seal off the blast door so no one else, especially Zeph, could get in. Then retrieve Zeph's gun from the ground floor. She meant to go up to seal off the door first, but in her feverish haze, she found herself crawling on the first level catwalk. When she arrived at the silo's concrete base, she crawled to a metal cabinet and found, hidden inside, Zeph's gun. She took it and stumbled back toward the ladder and climbed up to the first catwalk. She was about to kill herself when she remembered Zeph. The blast door wasn't sealed off. He would come in here and die. Two levels above her, she heard the blast door open. Two blurred figures, not Zeph, stepped onto the upper catwalk. The paler, taller one lifted a small dark device and pointed it at the warp ship. There is significant damage to the fuselage and primary intercooler system. She squinted up and quietly lifted the gun with shaking hands and listened. We should have the original blueprints in the Enterprise computer. She didn't wait any longer. She pulled back the bolt and began to fire. Hold your fire. We're here to help you. She peered over the railing to see if they were dead, and instead watched the paler man step over the railing of the catwalk and drop 40 feet to the scaffolding below. Then he did it again. She lifted Zeph's gun and fired. She saw the bullets tear into his torso. All the same, he landed right in front of her on the catwalk. The gun empty, Lily lowered it and blinked at the creature standing before her. He wasn't human. His face was the color of shimmering moon gold, his eyes amber. Greetings. The creature began to walk toward her. In the timeless instant before she fell forward and her head struck the metal grating, she thought, It's all over. There's no hope for anyone anymore. I'm sorry, Zeph. As Picard stepped back into the silo, Beverly Crusher at his side, they heard Data's urgent call. Captain, this woman requires medical attention. Picard and Crusher hurried down to where the dark-skinned young woman lay unconscious. Beverly used her medical scanner and checked its readout. Severe theta radiation poisoning. Data looked up from his tricorder. The radiation is coming from the damaged throttle assembly. Beverly's blue eyes narrowed. We're all going to have to be inoculated, and I need to get this woman to sickbay, and no lectures, John Luke, about the Prime Directive. I'll keep her unconscious. Very well, Doctor. Tell Commander Riker to beam down with a search party. We need to find Cochrane. Crusher to Enterprise, two to beam directly to sickbay. As the two women dematerialized, Picard turned to Data. We have less than 14 hours before this ship has to be launched. Picard to Engineering. In the Enterprise's engineering section, LaForge listened to what Picard had to say. Geordi, Cochrane's ship was damaged in the attack. I want you to assemble an engineering detail and get down here. We have some work to do. Aye, sir. LaForge repressed a grin. A chance to work on the Phoenix. Zephram Cochran's ship, the mother of all warp drives. On his way out, he spoke to Ensign Paul Porter, a recent addition to the Enterprise. Porter, you're in command here until I get back. LaForge ran a finger under his collar. He was starting to drip with perspiration. And take a look at the environmental controls. It's getting a little warm in here. When LaForge left, Ensign Porter went to the environmental panel and scowled. Both the temperature and humidity were rising alarmingly. At his side, Ensign Inga Iger followed his gaze. She hailed from one of the ice planets, and Porter liked her for her easy humor and quicksilver brain. She asked him, What do you think is going on? Porter was puzzled. It's like the entire environmental system has gone crazy. It's not just engineering, it's the entire deck. Maybe it's a problem with the EPS conduits. Porter moved over to an access ladder and climbed up to the hatch on the ceiling. 
While Iger watched, he opened the hatch and wormed into the maintenance crawl space. Inside, the damp heat was oppressive. He started scanning the conduits for any sign of malfunction. An odd noise came from somewhere down the crawl space. He looked up just in time to see a dark shape the size of an adult human suddenly disappear around a corner. He crawled further down the tube to an intersection. A glance to the left revealed a stunningly bizarre sight. The orderly arrangement of conduits had been altered in a ghastly manner. Alien power packs had been randomly attached using both mechanical cables and those fashioned from flesh, tissue, and bone. He was so amazed that he did not hear the renewed soft skittering, did not see the dark shapes looming until the very millisecond they were upon him. It was all very swift. Swift recognition, swift terror, swift pain. Then swift nothing at all. Hot and somewhat worried, Inga Iger was waiting beside the ladder that led to the maintenance hatch when she heard the horrible sounds. Ensign Porter, you okay in there? She climbed the ladder at top speed and opened the hatch. She never saw him. Instead, a dark shape was hovering only meters away, waiting. She made a move to pull back, but there was no time. No time to run, think, breathe, or even scream. Inside the missile silo, the card stood beside Troy, Data, and Will Riker as the four of them admiringly examined the almost repaired Phoenix. The captain had been thinking of little else except the vessel and the chances of finding Zephram Cochran alive, when at once a sense of foreboding seized him. Whispers in his head, separate yet unified, the collective, and it spoke of the Enterprise E. The card to Enterprise. Is everything all right up there, Mr. Worf? Yes, sir. But we are experiencing some environmental difficulties on Deck 16. What kind of difficulties? Humidity levels have risen by 72%. The temperature has jumped 10 degrees in the last hour. Something about the combination triggered a mental alarm in Picard. Data and I are returning to the ship. He turned to Riker. Number one, take charge down here. The sight of the rebuilt Phoenix had made Picard hopeful, but his optimism would be short-lived if the Borg somehow managed to seize control of the Enterprise E. If that happened, there would be no hope for any of them. The Enterprise crew, Cochrane, the injured woman, the Earth of the past, or the Earth of the future. As Picard stepped with Data onto the bridge, he asked Worf to report. We have just lost contact with Deck 16. Communications, internal sensors, everything. Mr. Worf, seal off Deck 16 and post security teams at every access point. The Klingon leaned over his console and set to work at once. Picard took a step toward the newest lieutenant on the bridge. Mr. Hawk, before we lost internal sensors, what were the exact environmental conditions in main engineering? Hawk fingered his board skillfully. Atmospheric pressure was 10 kilopasquals above normal. 92% humidity, 39.1 degrees. Picard grimaced. Like a Borg ship. Worf was indignant. Borg? On the Enterprise? Picard was unsure how he knew for certain that it was true. They must have realized their ship was doomed. So they beamed here while our shields were down. After they assimilate the Enterprise, Earth. Hawk started in his chair. Sir, command control is being rerouted to main engineering. Weapons, shields, propulsion. Data, quickly. Lock out the main computer. The android sped to the nearest console and worked the controls with inhuman swiftness, his hands a blur. The card watched as encryption code scrolled across the monitor. In a matter of seconds, Data turned back to him. I have isolated the main computer with a fractal encryption code. It is highly unlikely the Borg will be able to break it. The lights on the bridge flickered and then went out, leaving only the emergency lighting. Only a few consoles remained functional. One of them was Worf's. The Borg have cut power to all decks. 
except 16. Hawk's eyes were wide, but he seemed determined to find some comfort in the midst of the horrifying situation. But without the computer, they won't be able to control the ship. Picard silenced him with a grim look. The Borg won't stay on deck 16. And the dreadful thing was, Picard knew it. Sweet, soothing darkness from which she was reluctant to rise. The first true rest since the war. Yet they wouldn't let her sleep. Wake up. Let's go. Move it. Uh, Lily moaned, shut her eyes, and tried to turn away. Come on, wake up. There's no time to explain. Uh, Lily blinked and lifted her head. And, looking at the red-headed woman's expression, got the definite impression that she'd better do exactly as she was told. With the woman's help, she pushed herself off the bed. Other people were rising from beds and being rushed by other people into a hole in the wall. All of them wearing the same black and gray jumpsuit. The redhead pushed Lily toward another woman. Alyssa, take her and go. At once, Nurse Alyssa Ogawa grabbed Lily's arm with no-nonsense firmness and began to steer her towards the people crawling into the wall tunnel. Lily realized everyone was terrified and fleeing from the noise that was growing thunderous. Something was trying to push its way in. Alyssa shouted over her shoulder. Those doors won't hold much longer. They're going to be right behind us. The red-headed woman who was obviously in charge cast a worried glance at the door. We need a diversion. Is the EMH still online? Alyssa glanced at a console. It should be. The hollow buffers are still functioning. The redhead wasted no more time. Computer, activate the EMH program. At that precise instant, it was Lily's turn to enter the crowded tunnel. But she lingered and watched as, out of thin air, a man appeared. He was slender, Caucasian, with dark, thinning hair and a vague, smug attitude. He seemed absolutely unconcerned about the loud battering and the collapsing door. He addressed the woman who had caused him to appear. Please state the nature of the medical emergency. Twenty Borg are about to break down that door and we need time to get out of here. The man grew irritated. This isn't part of my program. I'm a doctor, not a doorstop. I don't care. Just give us a few extra seconds. Dance for them. Tell them a story. Lily waited for the woman to crawl past her before allowing herself to be pulled along. Outside in sickbay, the door finally crashed inward, and she could just hear the man's voice. According to Starfleet Medical Research, Borg implants cause severe skin irritations. Perhaps you'd like an analgesic cream? Lily shook her head as she crawled after the others. This is one wild dream. By the time she had crawled on hands and knees a good quarter mile down the tunnel, Lily had come to realize that this was no dream. One thing that puzzled her beyond all understanding, the econ attack had come. She had gone to the silo and been exposed to an unbelievably fatal dose of radiation. She had been dying, and two men had come. She had shot at them. Then she'd awakened somewhere totally different and was now following a group of uniformed people she didn't know. She paused and held her injured hand in front of her face. No blisters, no pain, no radiation burn. So just where the hell was she? If these people were Econ and wanted to destroy the Phoenix, why were they trying to take care of her now? The redhead rounded a corner and the rest of the group obediently followed, except for Lily, who sat back on her haunches and waited silently as the group headed off in one direction. And when they were out of sight, she struck off in another. In the Enterprise E's security bay, as ten officers worked swiftly in the background to charge and test phaser rifles, Worf and Data listened intently to their captain. The first thing they'll do in engineering is establish a collective a central point from where they'll control the hive. He moved over to a large display pad 
activated it and called up a schematic of main engineering. The problem is, if we begin firing particle weapons inside engineering, we risk hitting the warp core. So I believe our goal should be to puncture one of the plasma coolant tanks. Data? An excellent idea. Plasma coolant will liquefy any organic material on contact. Worf regarded Data with a mixture of disdain and concern. But the Borg aren't entirely organic. Picard answered, No, but like any true cybernetic life form, they can't survive without their organic components. The Klingon grunted his approval. I have weapons set on a rotating modulation, but the Borg will adapt quickly. We will have a dozen shots at most. The captain acknowledged with a glance. One other thing. Warn your teams they may encounter Enterprise crew members who have already been assimilated. They mustn't hesitate to fire. Believe me, you'll be doing them a favor. The memory of Locutus rose, unbidden, and with it the agonizing moment when he had stared at the Borg's view screen and seen the horrified faces of his own crew there and been unable to cry out, to warn them, to do anything except parrot the words forced upon him by the Collective. He reached for one of the phaser rifles, trying to ignore the surprised reactions of his fellow officers, refusing to meet their eyes and see the concern that was, perhaps rightly, there. Worf cleared his throat. Captain, I do not believe you should accompany us on this mission. Your place is on the bridge. A muscle in Picard's jaw began to twitch, one that only did so during moments of great rage. He was not angry, he assured himself, not angry at all. He was justified. Objection noted, Mr. Worf. Let's go. Will Riker picked his way carefully over the mud and ice walkway that served as the ramshackle community's main thoroughfare. People had already emerged from their hiding places and swiftly put out the fires. He could only hope that Zephram Cochran was a survivor, too. He had not been among the dead in the silo's outer control chamber, nor had they found any sign of him in or near the Phoenix. Deanna had gone in search of him. Now, the Phoenix was almost ready for launch, and Troy had not returned to report on the search for Cochrane. The away team's need to blend in with the locals had precluded the use of comm badges, but invisible transponders had been used in case an emergency required a quick beam-up. Riker was using the signal from Deanna's transponder to locate her. The closer he moved toward Troy's coordinates, the louder the music they had called rock and roll became. At last, he stood in front of an olive drab tent bearing the hand-lettered sign, Crash and Burn. He entered. There wasn't a soul inside, save for Deanna Troy, who sat alone at the rickety bar, staring disconsolately down at a glass of amber liquid in front of her. Beside it rested another glass, empty. He found the jukebox old-fashioned power cord and yanked it out of the wall. Troy immediately turned around. Will, no, don't turn it off. Riker instinctively shielded his face from the exploding glass and felt the sting of tiny shards. He lowered his arm and found himself staring at a man, stubbled chin thrust indignantly upward, blue eyes narrowed and bloodshot. Those eyes regarded Riker with hostility and suspicion. Who told this jerk he could turn off my music? Without smiling or looking at either of the men, Troy introduced them. Will Riker, Zephram Cochran. Riker realized with awe, this was the great hero standing right before him. Cochran walked on wobbly legs to the bar and sat himself down beside Troy. Friend of yours? Yes. Husband? No. Good. He picked up her glass and poured the contents onto the dirt floor, then refilled her glass and his. Now this, Dina, is the good stuff. Here's to the Phoenix. May she rest in peace. He emptied his glass with a single gulp, then grimaced and hurled the bottle to the ground. Okay, that was bad. He rose and went back around the bar to a secluded storage area. 
Troy put her elbows on the wooden surface again and rubbed her temples. Will, I think we are going to have to tell him the truth. Riker glanced warily in the direction Cochrane had gone. But if we tell him, what about the timeline? This is no time to argue about time. We don't have the time. What was I saying? Deanna, you're drunk. I am not. Yes, you are. Look, he wouldn't even talk to me unless I had a drink with him. And then it took three shots of something called tequila just to find out he was the one we were looking for. And I've spent the last 20 minutes trying to keep his hands off me, so don't start criticizing my counseling technique. It's a primitive culture, and I'm just trying to blend in. You're blended, all right. She seemed not to hear, but continued. If you're looking for my professional opinion as ship's counselor, he's nuts. Riker turned and saw Cochrane beating his fists in the air and stamping his feet drunkenly in time to the music. Beside Riker came a faint thump. He whirled about to see Troy, face down against the counter, passed out. As Picard jumped from the last rung of the emergency shaft ladder to deck 16, he realized this would lead to the end of the ongoing struggle against the Borg, and nothing, not the Enterprise E, the bridge, or even duty, would keep him from being at the battle's conclusion. The deck was dimly lit and stiflingly hot. Data immediately dropped down beside him, followed soon after by five security officers. Weapons at the alert, they moved stealthily towards their destination, main engineering, where they would converge with Worf's security team. It did not take long for signs of the enemy to appear. As they approached an intersection, Data shone his light beam around the corner and stopped. The guard hurried silently to his side. Beyond, the corridor, bulkheads, decks, ceiling, were entwined by the leaden flesh and metal kudzu of Borg technology. Data audibly swallowed. Captain, I believe I am feeling anxiety. It is an intriguing sensation. I can see how it would be distracting for... Data, I'm sure it is a fascinating experience, but perhaps you should deactivate your emotion chip for now. Good idea, sir. The android tilted his head. For a millisecond, no more, his eyes grew vacant. Then, abruptly... All traces of tension vanished from his face. The card looked at him. Data, there are times I envy you. At the same moment, Worf and his team were stealing down their own section of Borg-modified corridor. Worf was glad Captain Picard had chosen to ignore Starfleet's orders and fight. The war would be difficult, and only with the help of the most courageous and determined warriors could it be won. Worf immediately reigned in his thoughts, forcing his mind to clear. To the right, a noise. The Klingon turned, rifle in hand, and aimed it at a hatch in the bulkhead, which slowly opened. Something began to emerge from the shadows. The six warriors leaned in and fingered their weapons, ready for the kill. Finally, out into the arc of light cast by their rifle beams, a face became recognizable as Dr. Crusher. It's only me, Worf. The doctor crawled out and extended an arm to Nurse Ogawa, and she continued speaking. There was a civilian with us, a woman from the 21st century. We got separated. She has no idea what's going on. You've got to find her. The Klingon gave a swift nod, then turned to a team member. Lopez, get these people back to Deck 14. As Crusher headed off with her patients, Worf wondered just how unsettling would it be for someone born three centuries ago to step from a war-ravaged Earth onto a Borg-besieged Enterprise. Picard led the way down the assimilated corridor, with Data a close second and the five guards following just behind. As Picard rounded a blind corner, he slowed. 
two Borg drones walked past them. Picard stretched out an arm in front of his team. Wait. Hold your fire. They'll ignore us until they consider us a threat. Once again, he knew the inexplicable. The Collective had sensed them, yet felt no fear, sounded no alarm. Soon they came to another intersection and turned the corner that Picard knew would lead them straight to the heart of the Collective. Some 15 yards directly in front of them stood the tall double doors marked Main Engineering, the one recognizable landmark. All else had been corrupted by the same insidious, creeping tangle of tubing, wires, power packs, and circuitry, all jammed together without thought for convenience or design. And between it all, just as he had dreamed, Borg drones stood slumbering in their specialized alcoves, close enough to touch. The two walking Borg slipped into their alcoves and closed their eyes to sleep the dreamless sleep of the Collective. Picard looked up and saw Worf and his contingent arriving from an adjacent corridor. With a flick of his hand, the captain motioned for the two teams to merge. The distance to engineering's double doors was short, but never, Picard decided, had he ever taken so long a walk. The sight of those doors evoked again the mysterious image of a woman's upcurved lips, pale yet seductive, and the low, beckoning whisper, Locutus. At last, the goal was reached. Picard glanced back at the security team, then gave Data a nod. Data opened an access panel beside the doors, coiled his hand around the emergency release handle, and pulled. The handle broke off in his hand. The doors remained closed. Picard turned to see a dozen Borg emerge from their alcoves and begin to advance toward the teams with implacable, deadly calm. Worf ordered the teams to ready phasers. Fire! Four streaks of light found their targets, tearing into the black-clad Borg torsos with whines and sizzles. Four Borg fell backward, killed, or rather, as Picard thought, freed, so that the original owners of the flesh bodies and helplessly trapped minds could escape the special hell that was assimilation. Beside the captain, Data whirled about lifted his rifle and fired at a drone who was on the verge of making it past the protective semicircle of guards. Picard hurried to another access panel on the other side of the doors, opened it, and began pulling out the circuitry and rearranging it. If the others managed to cover him long enough, he would be able to override the lock. Borg after Borg fell, yet more and more still came. He was near success when Worf gave the warning cry, Captain, they've adapted. The phasers went silent. Picard pulled the final adulterated bit of circuitry free and jammed it into the proper socket. Immediately, the panel sparked, then went dull. The doors jerked open a thumb span to reveal darkness. Picard rushed to the doors and tried to pull them apart. It worked. The doors gave a slight groan, then began to slide slowly apart until they were open, almost enough for Picard to slip inside if he could just make it to the plasma coolant tanks. Out of the darkness, a phosphorescent white face, white hands surged toward him. Picard stared at the hands and saw something black, sharp, metal, unsheath itself from each of the white fingernails, something that sought to reclaim Locutus. The Collective's knowledge seized him once again, These talons, once inserted beneath the skin, would entwine their swift evil tendrils about his spine, his nerves, his brain, and give birth to a Borg. He lifted the butt of his phaser rifle, ready to strike, despite the impossibility of victory. The drone's fingers came within centimeters of grazing his neck, then sailed up high overhead. Data had lifted the drone and hurled it across the corridor. Yet even as the Borg went flying through the air, three more swarmed forth from the shadows inside engineering. One seized Data's neck, the other two his arms and shoulders. He struggled to break free, but his attackers were stronger and pinned him fast. Picard moved to run toward his friend, but more drones stepped between them and began to stalk the captain. Data's eyes were wide, stricken, yet strangely calm. In the single beat of a human heart, 
the Borg drew their prey back into the shadows of engineering. The doors rumbled shut. At once, Picard whirled. The skirmish line was collapsing. No time for foolish bravery. Regroup on deck 15. Don't let them touch you. And he ran, weaving around his pursuers with a grace and speed born of mortal desperation. Oddly, the drones made no attempt to pursue Worf and the others. They don't care about the others. It's Locutus they're after. The card spun about to see a group of drones closing in. I will not be assimilated. He crouched low and hurled himself along the ground like a projectile towards the nearest Jeffrey tube and pulled open the hatch. He was about to climb in when a strangled voice came from the deck beside him. Help! The card turned. On the deck lay one of the young security guards, hands clawing at his collar, face contorted in frank agony. Beneath the tender skin of his neck, the assimilation device gave birth to a hundred tiny black serpents that lengthened rapidly, branching out like a fine, dark network of veins. Simultaneously, his temples began to pulse, then stretched taut as something metal pushed against the skin, then tore it and emerged. A sensor scalp. Please, help. The cart's chest heaved in a silent sob. He reached for his phaser rifle before the horror of what he had to do could stop him. It brought no consolation whatsoever to think that he had done what the young man requested. Before the Borg caught up with him, he scrambled into the Jeffreys tube and slid the hatch shut. The tunnel was dark, overheated, close, but desperation and adrenaline spurred him on. At last he neared the first intersection and forced both breath and pace to ease before he dared take the turn that led eventually to an access ladder and deck 15. A sharp pain across the skin of his throat made him gasp. I will not be assimilated. A body behind him, smaller than expected, groaned as he smashed it back against the opposite wall. The cable around his neck loosened at once. He plunged an elbow backward and felt nothing but ribs and soft flesh. His attacker emitted a high-pitched yelp. In the dimness, he saw a dark, sweat-slicked face. The woman from the missile silo. The one who had tried to shoot them down with bullets. Only now, instead of a gun, she held his phaser. Back off! Who are you? My name is Jean. No, what faction? Of course. She was from the mid-21st century and had interpreted the Borg attack as coming from the infamous Econ. I'm not part of the Eastern Coalition. Shut up. Just get me out of this hell. That's not going to be easy. She waved the phaser threateningly. Well, you'd better find a way to make it easy or I'm going to start pressing buttons. He studied her, thinking. If he bolted now, she would fire, most definitely killing him and probably herself from the ricochet off the tunnel walls. Very well, follow me. Data woke to abrupt full consciousness and the sight of a pale gray deck less than an arm's length away from his face. He was secured to a flat surface. An optical scan of the area revealed nothing. Captain Picard had been most wise in suggesting that he deactivate the emotion chip. As much as he wanted to experience abject fear, he felt that the lack of it now would permit him to deal more efficiently with such a difficult and most likely fatal situation. He shifted against the restraints. The table began to move. As he revolved, he studied his transformed surroundings. The great cavern that had been engineering was now dimly lit and swirling with mist, beads of moisture glittering upon the black cables and conduits that made up the cybernetic jungle. Drones moved about, intent on various tasks designed to further adapt the room to their use. Behind them were the plasma coolant tanks, fortunately unadulterated, 
but nestled within a Borg-modified bulkhead and well out of reach. As the table continued to rotate, a curious new sight caught the android's attention. Four Borgs standing together, each one's face connected by an elaborate series of tubing to the ceiling. As best he could tell, the Borg appeared to be feeding. Nearby, two drones worked steadily at a console. Data lifted his head and saw upon the monitor the encryption graphics with which he had protected the main bridge computer. Your efforts to break the encryption codes will not be successful, nor will your attempts to assimilate me into your collective. Brave words. I've heard them before from thousands of species across thousands of worlds, since long before you were created. But now they are all Borg. Data gazed up at the thick, dark tangle of tubing and circuitry that hung from the ceiling, swaying like weeds in a gentle sea. Amid them, his eye caught a rustle of movement, a woman's face, chalk pale, but hauntingly beautiful. Data countered, I am unlike any life form you have encountered before. The codes stored in my neural net cannot be forcibly removed. You are an imperfect being, created by an imperfect being. Finding your weakness is only a matter of time. As she spoke, three drones stepped forward to stand beside the table. In place of a hand and fingers, long stiletto-sharp spikes extruded from the casing, and, as Data watched curiously, began to spin. As the drills descended and bit into his scalp, the android reflected once again that it was a very good thing the emotion chip had been disabled. A very good thing. Some few hours past midnight, the encampment had grown quiet at last, and the air was piercingly cold. There was only one good thing about the war, as Ephraim Cochran thought, and that was the night sky. Without the glow cast by civilization, the stars shone dazzlingly bright. Nearby, the man named LaForge adjusted Cochran's telescope. Cochran was no longer quite as drunk as he'd been when Deanna entered the crash and burn, and that frightened him. It would have been easier to write off what was happening now as an ethanol-induced hallucination, or a paranoid delusion, a product of the madness he'd been fleeing since the war. Before the war, life had been simple. Mood disorder, bouts of depression, alternating with skyrocketing mania, no problem. Have your DNA toyed with a bit so that you'd never pass on the disease and wear an implant, and have it changed once a decade. He'd gotten the implant as an adolescent. Cochran hadn't even thought about it until after the war, Eleven years after he'd received his last implant, that was when his acquaintance with mania began. A night came when he was sitting outside the silo, very near where he sat now, staring up at the silent stars, and the revelation came. The nuclear core in the silo's missile. It was the same fuel his theoretical warp engine required, was it not? Why not beat that damn sword into a plowshare? and used the bomb to make an actual ship that he could test. He worked ten days and nights in the silo without sleep, without food, with only the water in his canteen. He would stay there working, he vowed, until he got the ship, the Phoenix, ready for launch. At the time, it never occurred to him that he was looking at a good decade's worth of work. Over two weeks' time, the euphoria gradually faded until one day he found himself racked by such despair and doubt that he couldn't find a reason to get out of bed. It was a few weeks later when he emerged enough from the depths of hopelessness to climb down into the silo once more that he saw all the work he'd done in his speeding three brainstorms a minute phase. He'd expected to find it useless, poorly wrought, incomprehensible. Instead, he found it perfect, brilliant, startlingly insightful, in fact, his best work. When manic, he drank 
because it eased the unbearable racing of his thoughts and the insomnia. When depressed, he drank because it eased the pain. Because of the shame, he drank when he was lucid, too. There were no implants available anymore for the disorder. A week ago, when both he and Lily realized that the Phoenix was finally going to be ready for launch, he'd felt himself catapulted from blessed normality into manic euphoria. And he'd spent the whole week bargaining with the universe. Please, just let this last long enough. Don't let me plunge into a depression until after she launches. As long as he didn't become too manic, too excitable, he'd make an excellent pilot. Now, Cochrane stared hard and skeptically at Will Riker's neatly bearded pink face. Let me make sure I understand you correctly, Commander. A group of cybernetic aliens from the future have traveled back through time to enslave the human race. And you're here to stop them. Riker's open, cheerful face wore a faint smile. That's right. Can you fly, too? We're going to prove it to you. Jordy, how are you doing? These old refractors are tricky to align, but I think I've got it. Come take a look. Cochrane stooped down and looked into the eyepiece of the telescope. Against the glittering and velvet background of stars and indigo sky, a great ship hung, her sleek hull crafted of shining pale gray metal. Cochrane jerked his head up at once and glared at the others. It's a trick. How'd you do that? I don't believe it. Riker smiled with pride. Believe it. That's our ship, the Enterprise. And Lily's up there right now? That's right. Can I talk to her? We've lost contact with the Enterprise. We don't know why. Cochran bent down one more time to peer at the handsome vessel in infinite amazement. So, what is it you want me to do? Riker grinned. Simple. Conduct your warp flight just as you planned. Cochran paused, calculating. Whether this was all a hallucination or not, what possible harm could it do to try to accomplish his dream? Well, all right. But it'll take a couple of weeks to build a new field generator. LaForge spoke up. We have the technology to repair your ship tonight. Riker glanced at both men. It's imperative that you make the flight tomorrow morning by 11.15 at the latest. Why? Because at 11 o'clock, an alien ship will be passing through this solar system. They're on a survey mission. They have no interest in Earth, too primitive. But tomorrow morning, when they detect the warp signature from your ship and realize that humans have discovered how to travel faster than the speed of light, they'll decide to alter course and make first contact with Earth. Right here. LaForge pointed to a spot just east of the concrete where Cochrane sat. I think that's where the monument's going to be. Riker nodded. It's one of the most pivotal moments in human history, Doctor. You get to make first contact with an alien race, and after you do, everything begins to change. Upon hearing this, Diana's beautiful face lit up with joy at a long-past memory Cochrane had yet to live through. It unites humanity in a way that no one thought possible, once they realize they're not alone in the universe. LaForge joined in, grinning like Riker and Troy. Your theories on warp drive allow fleets of starships to be built, and humankind to start exploring the galaxy. Diana spoke again. And before long, Earth will become a paradise. Poverty, disease, war, they'll all be gone from this planet in the next 50 years. Riker finished the story. But unless you make that warp flight tomorrow, before 11.15, none of it will happen. The Forge smiled warmly at him. I know this has been a lot for you to take in, Doc, but we're running out of time. We need your help. Are you with us? Cochran let go a deep sigh, then forced a weak smile. Why not? The others grinned in visible relief. As for Cochrane, Cochrane threw the telescope at the sight of the sleek and shining ship. If he could just hold on. Mm -hmm. 
Perspiration dripped from Lily's temples as she trained the futuristic-looking ray gun on her captive. Despite his bald head, with its fringe of silvering hair, he was a handsome man. It was his eyes that attracted and frightened her, for they emanated a breathtaking intensity and pain. The victim's pain she had seen too many times in the eyes of those who had survived the worst indignities of the war. Lily could not stop her mind from racing toward an explanation of where she was. She had come up with a possible three. One, this was a no-holes-barred, intense hallucination in her final dying moments. Two, this was a long and peculiarly vivid dream. Three, the explanation she liked least, but the one that was becoming more viable with each passing moment, this was no dream or hallucination, but reality. And that was the scariest thought of all. Lily gripped the weapon tightly. The man lifted a hatch cover, the merest slit, revealing on the level beneath them ends of the silent, standing cyborg men. Faces and bodies without minds, without hearts, without souls. She had no idea what she looked upon, but the ghoulish sight left her convinced that she preferred her captive's company. He glanced up. They're on this deck, too. We have to keep moving. He rose and headed off down the tunnel, utterly ignoring the weapon in her hand. Then inspiration apparently seized him. He pressed a panel on the wall. A hatch opened onto a large chamber, and he strode inside with a sense of purpose. She followed cautiously, scanning with the weapon at the ready, until she was certain no one else waited inside the room. It was empty, save for a grouping of couches and chairs facing the bare far wall. He stopped in front of a panel of push-button controls. This may be difficult to accept, but you're not on Earth anymore, you're in a spaceship. He lifted his hand and pressed a control. She stood motionless and watched as the great curving wall slid aside to reveal naked space and stars, and beneath them, vast and blue and shining, earth she staggered backwards what is this he turned toward the impossible sight that's australia new guinea the solomons montana should be coming up soon she forced her gaze away clinging to the wall listen to me i'm not your enemy i can get you home but you'll have to put that weapon down and trust me she felt a fresh surge of mistrust and backed away. My name is Jean-Luc Picard. What is yours? She managed to speak. Lily. He held out his hand for the weapon. Welcome aboard, Lily. She stared at him and slowly laid the weapon in his palm. As the tension eased, she gazed out the vast window, curious. There's no glass. The card moved fearlessly toward the opening and tapped what appeared to be empty space. The air shimmered with golden light, which abruptly faded when he withdrew his hand. Force field. Oh, I've never seen that kind of technology. That's because it hasn't been invented yet. And she turned and followed him through the door that had opened automatically as he neared it. Still bound in the dark, colorless heart of the Borg Hive, Data strained to watch as two specialized drones continued their surgery. The center of their attentions was his right arm and shoulder, both now encased in a cybernetic shell. Tubes emanated outward to a source he could not see. Within them, various colored liquids coursed. Within half an hour, the drones stepped back from the table. From above came the feminine voice. Are you ready? Data stared up through the mists at the dark tangle of flesh and machinery that obscured the ceiling. Who are you? I am the Borg. That is a contradiction. The Borg act as a collective consciousness. There are no individuals. The overhead darkness stirred. From its midst, the female creature emerged. Her face was humanoid. 
and her chalky coloring Borg. Her eyes were unlike either, dark with a decided glint of silver. Her body consisted of nothing more than head, neck, shoulders, and arms. Spider-like, she began to descend from the slick, gleaming web of machinery, her legless, torsoless body suspended by black cables. I am the beginning, the end. The one who is many. I am the Borg. Her truncated form descended smoothly into a synthetic Borg body that awaited below. With a click, her head and shoulders moved into place. The cables detached and swung away, and she moved toward Data with easy grace. Greetings. I am curious. Do you control the Borg Collective? I am the Collective. Data pondered this. Perhaps I should rephrase the question. I wish to understand the organizational relationships. Are you their leader? Her long artificial arms spread in a wide, sweeping V that encompassed the entire surroundings. I bring order to chaos. She smiled, sensuous lips parting to reveal teeth even and pearly. You are in chaos, Data. You are the contradiction, a machine who wishes to be human. I am programmed to evolve, to better myself. That is a drive common to many species. We too are on a quest to better ourselves, evolving toward a state of perfection. Forgive me, but you do not evolve. You conquer. She swept her silvered gaze over the length of his body. By assimilating other beings into our collective, we are bringing them closer to perfection as well. Somehow, I question your motives. Her eyelids lowered coyly. That's because you haven't been properly stimulated yet. She directed an intense, focused look at his skull, whose interior... A servo, Data realized. They had inserted a mechanical device inside his head. He gasped as a sudden chilling wave of fear seized him. You have reactivated my emotion chip. Why? Her attention was now on the cybernetic shell that encased the android's right arm. With a faint whir, it opened. Within lay his arm, stripped of its synthetic skin to reveal the inner layer of circuitry. And atop it, something new. A fragile, delicate patch of human flesh nursed by slender tubes of blood and fastened to the hideous mechanical surface by metal hooks and clamps. Do you know what this is, Data? It would appear you are attempting to graft organic skin onto my endoskeletal structure. She leaned low, gazing reverently at the attempted graft. What a cold description for such a beautiful gift. Her lips parted, and she exhaled a long breath onto the patch of flesh. The hairs on the exposed skin stood bolt upright. At the base of each, a small bump formed. Goosebumps, he had once heard Commander Riker call them. And the sensation. It was undeniably pleasurable. He looked up to see her face next to his, smiling slyly. Data? Was that good for you? Lily drew a deep breath and leapt through the hatch to the next level down where Picard waited. Picard paused to consult a computerized panel. On the recessor screen on the wall, a message flashed flanide. He was visibly relieved. Good. They haven't broken the encryption codes yet. Who? Those bionic zombies you told me about? Yes, the Borg. She gazed around her. How big is this ship? Twenty-four decks, almost seven hundred meters long. She did an honest double take. He was talk town, not a ship. How much did this thing cost? He smiled faintly. The economics of the future are somewhat different. Money doesn't exist in the 24th century. She whirled toward him. You don't get paid? 
the acquisition of wealth is no longer a driving force in our lives. She let go a cascade of laughter, mostly because the notion of Zeph Cochran and Lily Sloan building the Phoenix without thought of recompense was simply riotous. But her amusement ended abruptly with a horrified gasp. Directly ahead of them, the corridor was lined with a dozen hibernating Borg inside narrow alcoves. Worse, several Borg were moving about, working. She turned to flee, but he caught her arm. It's all right. They won't attack us unless we threaten them. Come on, I know what I'm doing. He took her hand and gently led her into the enemy's midst. Cyborgs moved past them, so close that she could feel the slight breeze stirred by their passing. It was the longest walk of her life, her life, cards exposed to focus. But in his eyes she saw his hate. At last they stepped from the corridor. The card peered down an adjacent corridor, and before Lily could stop him, he raised the ray gun. Borg equipment at the corridor's far end exploded in a rain of sparks. Two Borg turned and began to pursue them. Picard grabbed her hand and pulled her with him down the corridor. He suddenly paused at a set of double doors and hit a control. He motioned her inside. Lily came to an abrupt halt. The only light came from a small glowing control panel. She could see well enough to distinguish four bare walls and no exits. She turned to Picard. Is there another way out of here? He did not spare the time to reply, but hurried to the panel and began to tap it with his fingers. In the snap of a finger, no more dark, empty room. She found herself immediately transported to another place, another time. A nightclub in the early 20th century. She did a double take as something amazingly soft brushed against her skin. White satin. She was dressed in a long, alluringly fitted white satin dress. Lily glanced over in amazement at Picard, who wore a striped suit with a broad, old-fashioned necktie and a banded fedora at a rakish angle. Picard seized her arm and propelled her through the near-empty room toward the main bar. She realized the whole scene, including people, was a holographic creation. Picard called to the bartender. Anne glanced up from the glass he was drying and grinned. Dixon! Behind them, the two Borg pushed the holodeck doors apart and stepped inside, then hesitated, perplexed by the unexpected scene. A tuxedoed maitre d' with his slicked back hair approached the drones. I'm sorry, gentlemen, but we're closing. One Borg seized the unfortunate host's collar and dragged him close. A small black scope covering one of the drone's eyes began to flash and extended outward and focused a thin laser beam on the maitre d's face. Lily wondered if these holograms could suffer. Instead, his image flickered slightly, like a television on the fritz. The bartender called to Picard. Dix, what'll it be? The usual? Picard glanced up and down the bar. I'm looking for Nicky the Nose. The bartender frowned. He ain't been in here for months. Picard let go of breath in a moment of disgusted revelation. This is the wrong chapter. Computer, begin chapter 13. Lily blinked, and after that briefest of instants, saw that the bar was still the same, but the dance floor was filled with people, and the Borg had just entered the ballroom. Picard took her hand and drew her into the middle of the packed ballroom and began to dance. Try to look like you're having a good time. As the Borg moved somewhat nearer, Picard steered her through the crowd toward the far side of the room. Lily saw two huge Caucasian men sitting in a booth. Well, 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 look what the cat dragged in. Something about the man's demeanor and gaudy style of dress evoked Lily's memories of a long-ago history lesson. Mobster. That was the word. Nicky the Nose was a mobster. The Nose took a sip of his drink and smacked his lips. What's shaking, Dick? Just the usual, Nick. Martinis and skirts. Excuse me. He stepped over to the henchman and began patting him down for weapons. 
the Borg suddenly broke through the crowd and headed toward Picard and Lily. Desperate, Picard lunged for the violin case on the seat beside the henchman, popped open the case, and pulled out the large and very forbidding-looking gun, an ancient thing called a Tommy gun. He whirled to face the two Borg, who now were mere steps away from himself and Lily, pulled back a large black bolt on the weapon, and opened fire. Bullets ripped into the Borg, tearing patterns into the metal armor. Bullets ripped also into the surrounding tables, chewing wood into splinters. People screamed and ran out the doors. Picard kept on firing until the Borg crashed to the floor and the Tommy gun clicked empty. If he had had more bullets, he would have kept on shooting. At last, the angry henchman walked over to the dead Borg and gazed down at them with a loathing that chilled Lily to the core. Without a word, Picard opened a panel on one of the Borg's abdomen. Lily leaned forward to look and grimaced at the circuitry and cable tangled together with slick, quivering blood and bile-scented organs. I don't get it. This is all some kind of illusion, a, a bunch of holograms. If the gun isn't real... I disengaged the safety protocols. Without them, even a holographic bullet can kill. What are you doing? Looking for the neuroprocessor. Every Borg has one. It's like a memory chip. It'll contain a record of the instructions this Borg's been receiving from the Collective. She knelt on the corpse's other side and noticed the Borg wore the ragged remnants of a black and gray uniform. Hey, that's one of your uniforms. Picard didn't even glance up. This was Ensign Lynch. As he spoke, he ripped a chunk of circuitry from deep within the corpse's gut. Oblivious to the horror... The card neatly plucked a small, shining chip from within the mangled mess. Lily could look at the captain no longer. Instead, she fixed her troubled gaze on the dead ensign and saw, beneath the chalky flesh, hints of what had once been an individual human's features. She shook her head. Tough break. Yes, but we have to get to the bridge. She looked up at him. What was it Ma used to say? Be careful of the enemies you choose, because the more you hate, the more you become like them. Break, Zephram Cochran had given up any hope of sleep. The attack on the silo and his inordinately strange conversation with William Riker and company had stripped away any chance of taming the mania that seized him. Space travel, encounters with aliens, his own elevation to godhood. By dawn, his speeding thoughts had zoomed past pleasure and straight toward full-blown panic. 11 a.m., and the next few minutes afterward, if he could only last until then, could only maintain a measure of control, he might be able to make it. With that thought in mind, he had tucked a flask of booze beneath his fleece vest. Alcohol took some of the edge off, and eased the shaking of his hands. Despite the past few sleepless nights, he felt perfectly rested, even energetic as he made his way down the slope. The air still smelled strongly of smoke. In the near distance, what had yesterday been a lush evergreen forest was now a collection of blackened tree trunks emerging from charred, lifeless soil. He dashed behind a nearby Quonset hut, grabbed his long pole. A vaguely familiar voice came behind him. Doctor? He almost choked. Yeah? It was LaForge. Cheerfully, he offered what looked to be a handheld computer to Cochrane. Cochrane took the little computer and stared down at it, marveling at the quality of the display on the tiny screen, until he saw one of his own designs for the Phoenix there. I tried to reconstruct the intermix chamber from what I remember at school. Tell me if I got it right. Cochrane was aghast. You learned this in school? Yeah. Basic warp design is a required course at the Academy. The first chapter is called Zephram Cochran. Cochran stared down at the little computer screen. Well, it looks like you got it right. The engineer brightened visibly while Cochran wilted under his adoration. He glanced, panicked, around him. Most of the forest surrounding the settlement was burned away, but if he ran hard for a while he could make it past the damage into an area thick with evergreen. 
beside him, LaForge laughed, completely unaware of his companion's downward spiral into fear. I wish I had a picture of this. What? LaForge gestured at the immediate area around the silo. In the future, this whole area becomes a historical monument. You are standing in almost the exact spot where your statue is going to be. Cochrane was terrified. Statue? Yeah, it's marble, about 20 meters tall. You're looking up at the sky, your hand sort of reaching toward the future. Cochrane croaked. I have to take a leak. LaForge scowled suddenly at the silo doors, then down at his little computer. Leaks? I'm not detecting any leaks. Don't you people ever pee in the 24th century? The engineer's expression went from concern to amusement. Oh, leak! I get it. That's pretty funny. Cochran wheeled about and made for the woods, forcing himself to walk deliberately until the forge himself turned and headed back down into the silo. Then he yielded at last to the panic, the terror, the galloping madness that threatened to consume him, the world, the present, and the future, and began to run. Inside yet another Jeffrey's tube, the card steeled himself and reached overhead to pull the lever that would open the hatch. Above lay the Enterprise Bridge. The chance existed that the Borg had already arrived there. Inhaling deeply, he pulled the lever and felt the warmth of Lily's body as she huddled closer, heard her nervous sigh. The hatch slowly slid open. He found himself looking up at the business end of three phaser rifles, Starfleet issue, and the grim faces of Worf, Beverly, and Lieutenant Hawk. With relief, the three lowered their weapons, while the Klingon gave Picard a large dark hand. He took it, and stepped up onto a bridge, dim and overheated, but blessedly without Borg. This was still his ship. Beverly's relief was visible. Jean-Luc, we thought you were... Picard interrupted. Reports of my assimilation have been greatly exaggerated. And Doctor, I found something you lost. This is Lily Sloan. Beneath Lily's gaping scrutiny, Worf shifted uncomfortably. I am Klingon. Lily nodded. Cool. Picard wasted no more time. Report, Mr. Worf. The Borg control over half of the ship. We've been trying to restore power to the bridge and the weapons systems, but we have been unsuccessful. Crusher joined in. So far, there are 67 people missing, including Data. Picard lowered his head in grief for a moment, then forced himself to straighten. We have to assume they've been assimilated. I accessed a Borg neuroprocessor, and I think I've discovered what they're trying to do. They're transforming the deflector dish into an interplexing beacon. Hawk frowned, puzzled. Interplexing beacon? A kind of subspace transmitter. It links all the Borg together to form a single consciousness. If activate the beacon, they'll establish a link with the other Borg in this century. Crusher looked uncertain. But in the 21st century, the Borg are still in the Delta Quadrant. The card continued grimly. They'll send reinforcements. Humanity would be an easy target. Attack Earth and the past to assimilate the future. Worf came to the conclusion that his captain had intended. We must destroy the deflector dish before they activate the beacon. Picard thought over the possibilities. We can't get to a shuttlecraft, and it would take too long to fight our way down to deflector control. But, Mr. Worf, do you remember your zero-g combat training? Worf swallowed hard. I remember it made me sick to my stomach. Picard gave the Klingon a knowing look. I think it's time we went for a little stroll. Inside an Enterprise airlock, Picard secured the helmet to his spacesuit, then took the phaser rifle Worf offered. Captain, 
I have remodulated the pulse emitters, but I do not believe we will get more than one or two shots before the Borg adapt. Then we'll just have to make those shots count. Picard then addressed both the Klingon and Lieutenant Hawk. Magnetize. Picard moved to a wall panel and activated the control. The airlock door opened. Impulsively, he turned back toward Lily, who had insisted on seeing them off. She gazed up at him with a taut smile. Watch your caboose, Dix. I intend to. Then he led the others into the airlock. When Picard stepped from the airlock onto the ship's outermost surface, he let go of the sturdy railing at the exit. The infinitely vast backdrop of space, with the shining Earth in the foreground, evoked an instant of instinctive, dizzying panic. When he put his boot down against the metal hull, he did not hear it clank. If the boot's hold faltered for even a second, off he would drift into the void. Headed for what was, according to space legend, the loneliest and often longest of deaths. He drew a breath, steadied himself, then turned and helped out Hawk, then Worf. The three began to move in unnerving silence across the rounded underbelly of the saucer section. Picard turned to his former security chief. Worf, how are you doing? Not good. Try not to look at the stars. Keep your eyes on the hull. Worf complied. Soon his breathing slowed, and they began to make their way slowly across the immense sweep of hull. After a tedious, tense journey from the ship's underbelly, Picard, Worf, and Hawk at last arrived at the edge of the crater-like depression in whose center the deflector dish rested. Some fifty meters away, the large dish still glowed. But half of its surface and the critical stiletto-shaped particle transfigured by a towering, multifaceted crystal. From it protruded scores of isolinear spires. Worf emitted a low growl of disapproval. We should bring in reinforcements. Picard whispered into the comlink. There's no time. It looks like they're building the beacon right over the particle emitter. Hawk's reply filtered through the receiver in Picard's helmet. If we set our phasers to full power, aim them at the center of the dish. No, we can't risk hitting the dish. It's charged with anti-protons. We'll destroy half the ship. Worf gave his assessment. There are six Borg. I would not suggest a direct assault. Picard sighed. No, we need another way. Though precisely what that might be, he had no idea. In the tropical mists of the Borg Hive, Data attempted unsuccessfully to remain as calm and detached as he had been before the emotion chip's activation. The two surgical drones continued to meticulously attach pieces of flesh to his android body. The Borg female, still attached to her synthetic body, stood over the surgical table, her sharp, narrow features an elegant study in black and white. Her dark, full lips curved upwards with pleasure. I am curious. Are you using a polymer-based neuro relay to transmit the organic nerve impulses to the central processor in my positronic net? And if that is the case, how have you solved the problem of increased signal degradation inherent to organosynthetic data transmission? The woman interrupted. Do you always talk this much? Not always, but often. Your android brain is capable of so much more. Have you forgotten? I am endeavoring to become more human. Human. We used to be exactly like them. Flawed, weak, organic. But we evolved to include the synthetic. And now we use both to attain perfection. Your goal should be the same as ours. Believing oneself to be perfect 
is often the sign of a delusional mind. Small words from a small being trying to attack what he doesn't understand. I understand that you have no real interest in me, that your goal is to obtain the encryption codes for the Enterprise computer. That is one of our goals, but in order to reach it, I am willing to help you reach your goal. As she spoke, one of the drones again began to lift a restraint, this time on Data's arm. Data lashed out, slamming the Borg aside. With android speed, he broke off the other restraints, then rose to find his surgeons in pursuit. He reached out for the first and flung the drone across the room. The other who kicked into a far tangle of moist tubing and cable was the Borg, merely moved out of the way and watched in mild interest, then tilted her head in a silent command. Data came to an abrupt halt when a shimmering force field flashed in front of him. He whirled about and faced a third drone, one who lifted a misshapen metal hand from which emerged gleaming silver claws, razor sharp. With purely human instinct, Data raised his right arm to shield his face. The talons flashed, swept through the air with a faint whistle, bit into tender flesh. Data gasped, stunned by the bright, searing shock of pain. He stared down at his arm in amazement at the narrow rivulets of blood. The Borg Queen raised a hand, instantly stopping all the alerted drones who had moved in for the kill. Look at yourself, Data. Standing there, cradling the new flesh I've given you. If it means nothing to you, why protect it? Tear the skin from your limbs as you would a defective circuit. We won't stop you. Don't be tempted by flesh. He drew a breath and reached for the edge of a patch of new skin, braced himself, then dropped his hand. The female neared him. Are you familiar with physical forms of pleasure? If you are referring to sexuality, I am fully functional, and I have been programmed in multiple techniques. How long has it been since you've used them? With the emotion chip activated, the accessed memory brought with it the image of Tasha Yar, golden hair oiled and glistening. It also brought grief at the remembrance of her death. Eight years, seven months, sixteen days, four minutes, twenty-two seconds. The Borg Queen drew even closer. Far too long. She tried to stare deeply into his eyes. In response, Data averted his gaze and affected an expression of confusion. But his eyes were focused on the distant wall and the plasma coolant tanks as he made his decision. Then he raised his face and boldly returned her stare, determined to yield to the inevitable. And when she kissed him, he pressed a hand to the small of her back, his expression tranquil, at peace with his choice. With Jordy LaForge beside him, Will Riker leaned against a tall, fragrant pine and watched as Zephram Cochran struggled up a steep incline, unaware of the Starfleet engineers surrounding him. Riker could accept that the man was erratic and had a serious addiction to alcohol, but he could not accept that the man had run away from what he cared about most. The doctor, panting and uncoordinated from drink, made it halfway up the incline, then stopped. Apparently, he had finally seen the Starfleet at the top of the slope, for the scientist turned and began scrambling in the opposite direction. But another officer moved out to block Cochrane's path. Once again, he whirled about and ran in yet a third direction, directly toward Riker and the forge. Will gave Geordi a nod. Together, the two emerged from the trees in front of the fleeing man. Cochrane's eyes were wild with panic. I'm not going back! LaForge took a step forward. Doc, we can't do this without you. I don't care. Get away from me. Riker sighed. We don't have time for this. In a swift move, he drew his phaser, aimed, and fired. The mild blast struck Cochran square in the back, causing him to drop onto the pine needle thatch. Riker hurried over to him, 
and, LaForge at his side, looked down at Cochrane's unconscious form. I just don't get it. Why did he run? Riker didn't know the answer. Maybe Deanna can help us instead. And help had better come soon, Riker thought. Within two hours, in fact. Or there would be no point in worrying about the Enterprise or Cochrane or a spacefaring future at all. Once Picard had explained to Worf and Hawk what actions were needed, he had divided the work among them. Hawk had departed, leaving Worf and Picard to make their way along the slope of the deflector dish. Mindlessly, the Borg ignored them and finished attaching a component. Two nearby crystalline spires lit up. Picard and Worf moved on until at last they reached the curving bottom of the deflector array. On the array's far side, a third space-suited figure drew closer to the Borg working on the dish. Hawk. Worf began to move off in another direction from his captain, toward his assigned task. Picard hurried onward and found the access point, a section of hull labeled Maglock Portal 2. He squatted down, then popped open the deck plate panel. Beneath lay a web of circuitry and controls. As soon as the Borg realized what he and the two men at Maglock Portals 1 and 3 were doing, they would pursue. Unfortunately, there was less time than he'd hoped. A shadow fell nearby on the pale, gleaming hull. Picard glanced up to see, some twenty meters away, a drone heading slowly toward him. Almost simultaneously, a bright phaser, and he looked across the array to see Hawk lowering his rifle while a wounded Borg went skidding backwards in a shower of sparks. Hawk went back to work, utterly unaware of the approach of yet another drone from behind. Picard shouted into his helmet, Hawk! Before the young man could position his weapon and fire, the drone was upon him reaching out with inhumanly strong hands and translucent nails from beneath which extruded talons, black and slick and writhing. Picard closed his eyes briefly. Hawk did not scream, did not cry out, but the calm link between them was still open, and he heard the primal, horrified gasp, then the sound of tortured breathing as the talons found their way home. Then, silence. Worf's voice filtered through the comlink. The magnetic constrictors are disengaged. Worf, get up to Hawk's position and complete the cycle. Worf gave a warning. They've adapted. Then Picard had to stop his work. The Borg was now only two arm lengths away. He reached for his phaser rifle, useless against the Borg, and yet not entirely so, and fired at the stretch of hull between himself and his pursuer. The deck plate gave way, causing a powerful blast of gas to stream from the gaping tail. The force of it knocked the drone onto his back, but Picard felt no surge of exhilaration. For in front of him, four, then six spires began brilliantly to glow. As the Borg reached for him, Worf bared his teeth. He almost permitted the creature to catch hold of his spacesuit, then whipped forth the curving batleth hidden on his back. With a swift and shining slash, the weapon neatly severed the drone's forearm in a spray of quickly extinguished mechanical sparks and blood. Undaunted, the Borg lunged, extending a surviving hand transformed into a collection of deadly, double-edged knives. One of the blades caught a small piece of fabric on Worf's leg, filling his helmet with the urgent hiss of rapidly fleeing oxygen. With a warrior's will, he focused everything on his weapon and his foe. In the millisecond before the Borg recovered to lunge again, Worf lashed out again and directed the Batleth's blade into his enemy's neck. The Borg shrieked silently and convulsed before dying. Only then did Worf permit himself to realize that his vision was dimming, that his lungs were gasping desperately for air which had already gone. He stumbled, dizzied, as the suit's built-in alarm filled his head. Warning, decompression in 45 seconds.
protected behind a curtain of spewing gas, Picard worked furiously, digging through mazes of complex circuitry until at last he found what he sought. With extreme effort, he pulled a lever upward, then twisted. From deep within the Enterprise E's heart came a shuddering vibration and the silent but unmistakable sensation of a metal clank. Nearby, the portal where Hawk had been working still lay open. He started at the realization that one of the final three isolinear spires had come brilliantly alive. He felt a vibration on the deck plate beneath his boots. He whirled and saw that the pursuing drone had patiently made its way around the long curtain of venting gas. The Borg raised a cybernetic arm the hand of which had been replaced by a jagged circular saw. With total dispassion, the Borg wielded the weapon and drew closer. I will not yield again. Picard reached down and hit the magnetic control on his spacesuit's thigh. Immediately, the green light went dark. The metal soles clicked, then became stomach-wrenchingly light. Picard began floating upward into space, beyond the Borg's lethal grasp. The sensation was terrifying. He had to force himself to maintain his concentration, to draw in his legs at the proper time and then kick with all his might against the curving hull. The act hurled him over the head of the hapless Borg toward the far side of the array and Hawk's panel. At last, he crashed into the hull. He scrambled for a handhold, found one, and remagnetized his boots. Within a few steps, he reached the deck plate Hawk had removed and reached down into the open areas of controls, then grabbed the hydraulic lever. A pull, a twist. Beneath his feet, the sensation of a thunk as massive clamps were released. The first bolt attaching the deflector dish to the Enterprise was blown outward into space. Then the others. And the deflector dish itself, along with the brightly glowing crystal, began to float upward. But at the height of slightly more than a meter above the hull, the still glowing dish stopped, tethered to the Enterprise by a thick pillar of power cables. He lifted his phaser rifle, took careful aim, but before he could fire, he sensed movement in the periphery of his vision. Immediately, he turned and found himself face to face with an inhabited Starfleet spacesuit, Hawks, judging from its size. The body inside the spacesuit lunged at him. Picard knew that inside that mindless shell, the personality named Hawk was still there, infinitely horrified and helpless, praying for Picard's victory. Hawk seized his shoulders, tried to slam him down against the deck plate. Picard fell backward. Fortunately, Borg Hawk was too new to the collective to have been fitted with cybernetic weaponry. Unfortunately, his strength was now at least ten times that of Picard. Hawk was upon him, fist smashing into his helmet's faceplate. The plate began to crack. Picard vowed silently he would not yield. Borg Hawk lifted his fist for the final blow. The phaser blast came so near to his face that he was immediately blinded and lay gasping against the hull. Hawk's limp arms and legs slowly pinwheeled around a scorched torso. Picard struggled to his feet and saw, to his utter delight, Worf. The Klingon stood some meters away, lowering his rifle. He stepped toward Picard. Something black and white moved with him. Closer inspection revealed the suit's tear in mid-shin, just below the knee. A long piece of tubing was serving as a tourniquet. The excess dangled behind like a leash. Picard realized the black and white object was in fact a Borg hand attached to a severed forearm from whose bloodied metal wound extruded the long tube. Yet the captain at once drew his attention away to an even ghastlier sight. Although the dish hovered above the ship's surface, cables still held it fast. The entire beacon began to pulsate with power. Picard reached for his phaser rifle, aimed and directed a searing bolt directly at the thick cable tether. Abruptly, the beacon and its myriad spires died. And when the dish had at last risen a good 20 meters, a safe distance, the Klingon aimed his rifle spaceward 
and snarled. Assimilate this. Picard shielded his eyes as the deflector dish erupted in a shower of white-hot debris. As the beacon hurtled dark and silent into space, Picard vowed to hunt the Borg down, drone by drone by the heart of the Collective. And he would pierce that heart with a wound deeper than that inflicted on his own. Pierce it, even though it meant his death. In the warm, moist womb of the Borg Hive, she who was all lifted her head sharply at the vision of fire and shattering crystal, at the silent sound of death cries. Locutus. The hour would now not be long. The time would soon come. She would look upon him again, again present the choice. And this time, she would have her revenge. Worf groaning softly beside him, Picard waited inside the airlock. On the other side, Beverly Crusher worked the controls. Lily stood beside her, smiling. Flanked by Worf, Picard stepped through the airlock door and removed his helmet. We stopped them, but we lost Hawk. Beverly's blue eyes registered the loss, but she was already moving forward to help Worf, who fumbled in his efforts to remove his helmet. A security officer crawled from a Jeffreys tube. They're on the move again. The Borg just overran three of our defense checkpoints. They've taken decks five and six. They've adapted every modulation of our weapons. It's like we're shooting blanks. Picard told him at once. We'll have to start working on a new way to modify our phasers so they're more effective. In the meantime, tell your people to stand their ground. Fight hand to hand if they have to. Worf turned to Picard. Captain, weapons are useless. We must activate the auto-destruct sequence and use the escape pods to evacuate the ship. Lily leaned forward, hopeful. Escape pods? Tell me more about those escape pods. Picard snapped in reply. We are going to stay and fight. We have not lost the Enterprise and we are not going to lose the Enterprise. He jerked his head to glare at the security officer. You have your orders. Worf and Crusher watched in silence as the younger man nodded again and walked back to the Jeffreys tube. Lily stared at Picard. I'm not one of your troops, and I really don't want to stick around while you guys fight these space monsters, okay? I want to go home. Worf's tone grew strident. Captain, I must object to this course of action. With all due respect, sir, I believe you are allowing your personal experience with the Borg to influence your judgment. The fury grew electric as it traveled down Picard's spine. I never thought I'd hear myself say this, Worf, but I actually think you're afraid. You want to destroy the ship and run away. The Klingon growled. If you were any other man, I would kill you where you stand. Get off my bridge. The Klingon turned and moved for the open Jeffrey's tube hatch, then crawled inside. Lily watched as Picard scanned the shocked faces of his remaining crew, then silently turned and headed into another chamber that opened onto the bridge. When the door had closed behind him, Beverly Crusher turned to Lily. Let's go. But Lily didn't move. What do we do now? A shadow came over Crusher's face. We carry out his orders. Lily interrupted. Wait a minute, this is stupid. If we can get off this ship and blow it up, we should do it. Crusher's voice was carefully composed. Once the captain's made up his mind, the discussion is over. Lily's fury grew. We'll see about that. And she headed into the observation lounge. Picard glanced up to see Lily storm into the room. He stopped his task of disassembling a phaser rifle. She stopped on the other side of the table. You bastard. Look. I don't know jack about the 24th century, but I do know that everyone out there thinks that staying here and fighting the Borg is suicide. They're just afraid to come in here and say it. He felt himself turn to ice. The crew is accustomed to following my orders. Captain, they're probably accustomed to your orders making sense. None of them understand the Borg as I do. What's that supposed to mean? I was one of them. So you can imagine, Lily, I have a 
somewhat unique perspective on the Borg. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have work to do. He reached for the phaser rifle, popped open another panel. Lily smiled ruefully. I am such an idiot. It's so simple. Revenge. This is about revenge. The Borg hurt you, and now you're going to hurt them back. He gave her a cr- In my century, we don't succumb to revenge. She leaned closer to him. I saw the look on your face when you shot those Borg on the holodeck. You were almost enjoying it. Admit it. You're not the first person to get a thrill out of murdering someone. I see it all the time. Get out, Lily. Her gaze bore right through him. Or what? You'll kill me? Like you killed Ensign Lynch? Her words at last touched his fury and ignited it. There was no way to save him. You didn't even try. Lily leaned in closer. You're as possessed now as you were when the Borg possessed you. This is not about revenge. This is about saving the future of humanity. She screamed at him. Then blow this ship up. The full depth of his rage emerged in one word. No. He lifted the rifle in his hand and hurled it across the room. It smashed against the case of Enterprise mementos, scattering ships and metals everywhere. The line must be drawn here. This and no further. I will make them pay for what they've done. He said it with such force that he startled himself into silence. Lily gazed at him with compassion. You broke your ships. Picard glanced up. She had been right, and had come here to show him the insanity of his own consuming hatred. He followed her gaze to the deck where Enterprise replicas lay scattered. Then he turned and moved to the window, to stare out at the earth and stars. He heard her footsteps headed for the door. Before she could reach it, he recited, He piled upon the whale's white hump, the sum of all the rage and hate felt by his whole race. If his chest had been a cannon, he would have shot his heart upon it. With an ironic smile, he turned to see her gazing at him in puzzlement. What's that? Moby Dick. Actually, I never read it. Ahab spent years hunting the white whale that crippled him, a quest for vengeance. And in the end, the whale destroyed him and his ship. For a long moment, he looked into her eyes. Then he drew a breath of pure resolve and walked out onto the bridge. Immediately, Crusher and the others turned to him, their faces anxious, somber, concerned. Prepare to evacuate the Enterprise. On the catwalk that led directly to the Phoenix's cockpit, Will Riker paused a moment to savor a sight. Zephram Cochran, flat on his back in the pilot's chair. It had been a very different man they'd revived in the silo's control room. Not nuts, Troy had said then, but clearly suffering from a chemical disorder of the brain. She thought it might be possible to treat some of the worst symptoms by using one of the non-sedating calming drugs provided in the standard first aid kit. Within a matter of minutes, Cochran the drunken and crazed had been transformed into Cochran the sober and rational. Now, Cochran scowled down at an old-fashioned dial display and looked over his shoulder at Riker. I have a four-alarm hangover, either from the whiskey or your laser beam or both. But I'm ready to make history. Troy to Commander Riker. We're ready to open the launch door. As the massive concrete silo door slid open, Riker lay on one of the astronauts' couches behind Cochrane's. Sunlight streamed into the cockpit from the crystal blue Montana sky. As he tightened the old-fashioned restraints that held him fast to one of the co-pilot's couches, he glanced over at Geordi LaForge, who had just settled back in the other co-pilot's couch across from him. The metal blast door slid shut, protecting Troy and the others inside the control room. The instant it began to close, Cochrane immediately became a pilot. Initiate pre-ignition sequence. The cockpit shuddered slightly as the engines at the ship's base began spewing nitrogen gas. 
Troy's voice filtered over the cockpit intercom. Control to Phoenix. Your internal readings look good. You're at the 30-second mark. Good luck. With all the last-minute checkdowns completed, the tension in the cockpit suddenly intensified. The silo abruptly disappeared, replaced by an onrush of pale blue sky. The Phoenix hurtled heavenward on a column of fire and smoke. Riker gave a glance to Geordi. The engineer was also enjoying the novelty of it all. Was overwhelmed by something far different than awe. His eyes were wide, bulging with pure terror. Of course, Riker realized. This was Zephram Cochran's first space flight. Finally, Cochran seemed to relax. Prepare for first stage shutdown and separation on my mark. Three, two, one. Mark. Riker performed his assigned task. The first stage booster dropped away, leaving three quarters of the craft spaceborne. And then the separation of the metal shield, allowing the primitive warp nacelles to extend themselves on either side of the fuselage. The noise and vibration abruptly stopped, leaving glorious calm and silence as the Phoenix settled into Earth's orbit. Riker peered at his controls. All right, let's bring the warp core online. Picard sat in the captain's chair. The order had been given. Most of the surviving crew members were now hurrying to escape pods. Computer, this is Captain Jean-Luc Picard. Begin auto-destruct sequence. Authorization Picard, 110 Alpha. A junior officer worked swiftly at a control panel, typing in a response to the request, enter destination coordinates. Immediately, a map of Earth appeared on the screen, which zoomed in on a mere pin dot of land in the South Pacific. Coordinates accepted. Landing target, Gravit Island. Area, 10 square kilometers. Population, zero. Crusher. Her face drawn and tense continued the litany. Computer, this is Commander Beverly Crusher. Confirm auto-destruct sequence. Authorization Crusher 22 Beta. Worf's voice was as subdued as Picard had ever heard it. This is Lieutenant Commander Worf. Confirm auto-destruct sequence. Authorization Worf 33 Gamma. Instantly, the computer responded. Command authorizations accepted. Awaiting final code to begin countdown. This is Captain Picard. Destruct sequence 1A, 15 minutes. Silent countdown. Enable. The computer intoned matter-of-factly. Self-destruct in 14 minutes, 55 seconds. There will be no further audio warnings. The three of them, Picard, Worf, Crusher, exchanged a solemn look. Picard rose and took a long, final look at his bridge. I barely knew her. Then they joined the calm group of bridge personnel, each awaiting a turn to crawl into the Jeffreys tube hatch that led to the escape pods. Picard met Worf's gaze. Mr. Worf, I regret some of the things I said to you earlier. doubt, you're the bravest man I've ever met. See you on Gravit Island. The Klingon nodded and then moved quickly to the hatch and disappeared. Picard followed, grabbing the hatch railings with his hands. Abruptly, the whisper of the collective filled his skull. And from within that stormy chorus, a small, distinctive voice emerged. Captain. Picard gasped. It was Data. He knew Data was unassimilated and about to be destroyed by his own captain's order. Pad in hand, Picard moved down the empty evacuation corridor, passing the endless row of escape pods. Only two remained vacant. He had already spotted Lily jogging slowly toward him. He met her in front of one of the remaining pods and handed her the pad before she could utter a word. If you see Commander Riker or any of my crew, give them this. She studied it curiously. What is it? 
orders to find a quiet corner of North America and stay out of history's way. A brief but awkward silence ensued, during which Lily kept her gaze fastened over long on the pad. At last, she gazed up shyly. Good luck. Picard smiled. To both of us. As she climbed into her pod, he turned and headed back down the corridor. Hey, your escape pod is this way. Oh, yes, I was just going to check on something. You're not going, are you? No, I'm not. When I was held captive aboard the Borg ship, my crew risked everything to save me. I have a friend who's still on this ship. I owe him the same. Lily considered this and gave a slow, sad nod. Go find your friend. She lingered an instant, no more, then entered the pod and met his gaze steadily as he pushed the hatch control. The pod sealed and she was irretrievably, utterly gone. Picard drew a steadying breath and made his way quickly to the master control panel on the wall, then launched the few remaining occupied pods. That done, he went to a large hatch that led to the engineering section. When the hatch slid open, Picard stepped through into a section of corridor defaced by the imposition of black, Borg-modified machinery and glistening organic matter. Determined, he continued his uneasy journey. At the intersection of two corridors, a pair of drones suddenly appeared and blocked his path. Picard halted. Had they known his intent, they would surely have killed him. Instead, they parted, stepping aside so that he might pass. An invitation. He was expected. At last, he arrived at the closed double doors of main engineering. He drew a breath stealing himself against the now overwhelming mental cacophony of the collective and prepared to step through the doors. But before he stirred a muscle, the doors opened. The incoherent chorus in his head abruptly stopped. They were waiting for him. He crossed the threshold into the image from his dream. Apathy. Row after row of dull, flesh-and-metal faces lined the vast chamber's walls. Sleeping drones in their honeycomb cells. A droplet-bejeweled thicket of black cables and feeding tubes descended from the ceiling like thick jungle vines. Apathy, yes, from the slumbering drones. But there was something more here, something passionate, something with a heart that could be pierced. The one who had violated him so. Movement behind him. When he slowly forced himself to turn, he saw her standing before him, and he recoiled in shock. What's wrong, Locutus? Don't you recognize me? He did. Memories bound for six years washed over him. On the Borg ship. Her face sharply beautiful and pale above his, as she gazed down approvingly at Locutus's terrible birth. We were very close, you and I. The chill of fear transformed into bitterly cold anger. Yes, I remember you. You were there. You were there the entire time. But that ship and all the Borg on it were destroyed. Her coy expression grew scornful. You think in such three-dimensional terms how small you've become. Data understands me, don't you, Data? From one of the alcoves, Data stepped forth, his expression entirely emotionless. And almost totally human. Golden eyes now blue, brown hair tousled, face almost entirely covered by pink human flesh. What have you done to him? Given him what he's always wanted. Flesh and blood. Let him go. He's not the one you want. Her lips parted in the sly, slightly mocking smile. Are you offering yourself to us? Offering myself? That's it. I remember now. It wasn't enough to assimilate me. You wanted me to give myself freely to the Borg. To you. 
The corner of an alabaster lip curled in repugnance. You flatter yourself. I have overseen the assimilation of countless millions. You are no different. You're lying. You wanted more than just another Borg drone. You wanted the best of both worlds. A human being with a mind of his own who could bridge the gulf between humanity and the Borg. You wanted a counterpart, an equal. But I resisted. I fought you. The curled lip rose higher. You can't begin to imagine the life you've denied yourself. Together, nothing could have stopped us. He took a deliberate step toward her. It's not too late. Locutus can still be with you, just as you wanted him. An equal. Let Data go, and I will take my place at your side. Willingly, without resistance. She moved closer her body almost touching his. Such a noble creature. A quality we sometimes lack. We will add your distinctiveness to our own. Welcome home, Locutus. Abruptly, she turned to Data. You're free to go, Data. The human android did not move. I do not wish to go. The Borg Queen smiled. As you can see, I've already found an equal. Data, deactivate the self-destruct sequence. The card reacted with alarm. Data, don't do it! Undaunted, the android moved calmly to a computer console and pressed a series of controls with preternatural speed. The computer reported, Auto-destruct sequence deactivated. The queen directed a smile of purely malevolent triumph at Picard. Now, Data, enter the encryption codes and give me computer control. Data complied, and when he looked up from his console, all the consoles in engineering blinked to life. As two Borg guards dragged Picard toward a surgical table, the near-human android moved to the Queen's side. He will make an excellent drone. Inside the Phoenix's cockpit, Riker watched the chronometer while LaForge made a final report. The historic moment was almost upon them. He smiled at Cochrane. They should be out there right now. We need to break the warp barrier within the next five minutes if we're going to get their attention. Geordi flicked a series of switches. The cell's charged and ready. Cochrane turned back and caught Riker's gaze, then turned back toward his controls. Engage. The ship did accelerate, but not like a starship. It would take a few minutes to attain warp speed. Geordi's eyes focused on his instrument panel. Warp field looks good. Structural integrity holding. Riker switched on the speedometer. Speed, 20,000 kilometers per second. Cochrane reached overhead for some switches, then happened to glance out the window. Jesus! The Forge and Riker looked up in tandem. Outside the window, the Enterprise E, massive, sleek, and gleaming, sailed into view. Riker grinned, pleased by the sight. The lack of communication with the ship had gnawed at him, made him worry that perhaps all aboard had been harmed somehow by the Borg. Communications or not, she had made it here all the same, to offer up protection in case it was needed. Relax, Doctor. They're just here to give us a send-off. Thirty seconds to warp threshold. Geordi pointed out the window. They're getting pretty close. The Enterprise was indeed closer, and if Riker hadn't known better, he might have thought she was giving chase. After Data's betrayal, the Borg had dragged the captain to a surgical table. Once again, Picard stared up at the Queen's delicate white features. She would again steal his existence, his body, his mind. He would again become her parrot, Locutus. And all of Earth and those upon it who dared dream would be obliterated, crushed. She lifted an instrument from the table, pressed a control, and watched a sharp, needle-thin probe emerge from its tip. He glared back at her, defiant. 
Data said behind him and out of view. The Phoenix is coming into range. I am bringing the phasers online. Picard watched as Data moved to another console, on whose monitor was displayed the long cylindrical capsule of the Phoenix, partly obscured by a blinking red crosshair. But Picard had not failed to notice that the console stood directly to one side of the plasma coolant tanks. Quantum torpedoes locked. The Borg Queen graced Data with a savage smile. Destroy them. Data shot an odd glance back at the Queen, turned, and took a step toward her and the coolant tanks. Resistance is futile. With blinding swiftness, he whirled and slammed his synthetic fist into one of the tanks. Liquid gas spewed from the resulting puncture, carrying Data across the vast chamber in a roiling wave, sweeping into the nearest alcoves of sleeping drones. At the same mad instant, the Queen looked toward the ceiling, summoning three long black cables that snaked downward at her silent command. Picard freed himself and stood up upon the surgical table to avoid the lethal flood that washed past him over the deck. When the cables arrived, he threw himself at them, succeeded in grabbing one, and began a desperate scramble toward the ceiling, away from the slowly rising gas. The Queen caught one of the other cables and pulled herself up as well. Then she shot an indignant glance at Picard and his cable, and gave the tendril a silent command. At once, the cable began to writhe, to lash, to whip about like an enraged serpent. The card began to lose his grip and slip closer to the swirling gas and death. Plasma coolant seethed only inches beneath his boots. On the cable beside him, the queen had managed to climb to his level. She reached forth with a delicate hand, caught his leg and yanked downward. He slipped. The sole of his boot skimmed the gas and began to hiss as it melted away. Again she reached to pull him down. A monstrous sight emerged from the roiling gas behind her. Data, the human flesh covering his face and arm grotesquely eaten away, revealing wiring and metal clamps strewn with half-liquefied blood vessels. The android hurled himself at the queen, knocking her from the cable. Together, they disappeared down into the swirling gas. Picard's thrashing cable gave an abrupt twitch, then fell limp. Immediately, he scrambled up to the ceiling and safety. Below, amid swirls of gas, lay the queen. Her dark hair and the pale flesh of her handsome face and hands bubbling as they slowly slid from her skeleton. From the pilot seat of the Phoenix, Cochrane bellowed. We're crossing the threshold! The ship around him seemed to dissolve. He felt himself go hurtling forward, weightless, as if his entire body had been launched from a giant slingshot. The stars surrounding him suddenly blurred, then began to streak past at dizzying speed. Zephram Cochrane let go a scream of purest joy, and with it, released ten years' worth of grief and cynicism, pain and hopelessness. Riker shared Cochrane's joy, but told him, That should be enough. Throttle back and bring us out of warp. Cochrane worked his control panel. Then he paused to stare out the front view shield at the stars which were once again twinkling pin dots. In the far distance, a blue one shone more brightly than all the rest. Cochrane nodded reverently at it. Is that Earth? LaForge answered. That's Earth. The scientist gave a slight shake of his head, marveling. It's so small. Riker leaned forward, still grinning. It's about to get a whole lot bigger. Picard climbed carefully through the thick tangle of cables and conduits to the far side of the room and the third level of the engineering deck. Below, the gas had ceased its roiling and settled into a calm, soft blanket, hiding the carnage beneath. He hurried to a wall panel, 
opened it and struck a control. The emergency ventilation system set to work. The captain at once moved to the edge of the deck and peered down to see the stripped metal skeletons of Borg drones, most fallen from their alcoves as they slept, interior metal workings spilled in maniacal fashion. The card scrambled down the access ladders to the first level and winced at the slight hiss as his boots met the deck. The sprawling metal carcasses were so numerous, the chamber so vast, that he spent some time looking through the black and gray sea before he recognized Data sitting among them. All of the new human flesh on the android's face and right arm had been stripped away, exposing the silvery android skeleton beneath. The card hurried to him, but was stopped in mid-stride. The voice of the collective was slowly rising in volume. Locutus. On instinct, the card whirled and saw behind him she who was all. A blinking steel cranium atop a smooth metal spine. She writhed in frustrated anguish, struggled to lift herself, to control as she had done from the beginning of time. He reached forth with his hands, and with a surge of inhuman strength, seized her slender metal spine and snapped it in two. The queen fell still, and within his skull there was a silence so deep, so primal, that he let go a silent sob. He was overwhelmed by the freedom. The collective at last was dead. When finally he turned, he saw his friend. Are you all right, Data? Apparently, the emotion chip was active, for the android replied with remarkable good humor. I would imagine I look worse than I feel. He gazed down at the corpse of the queen. Strange. Part of me is sorry that she is dead. She brought me closer to humanity than I ever thought possible. And for a time, I was tempted by her offer. Picard glanced up sharply. How long a time? 0 0.86 seconds. And for an android, that is nearly an eternity. Smiling, Picard helped him to his feet. Try to put it behind you, Data. The android hesitated. Is that what you did, Captain, six years ago? The smile abruptly left Picard's face. No. Captain's Log, April 5th, 2063. The voyage of the Phoenix was a success, again. The alien ship detected the warp signature and is on its way to a rendezvous with history. Braced by members of Picard's senior crew, Lily stood beside Zephram, gripping his arm. Farther away, hidden by the darkness, Picard and Dr. Crusher stood apart taking care that their mere presence did not alter the line of history. Lily gazed up at the sky, at the bright light that shone through the night clouds, the lights that had drawn every townsperson to the silo, the lights of a descending spacecraft. A murmur passed through the crowd as the colossal ship at last emerged from the clouds. To Lily, it looked rather like a huge pterodactyl spreading its great wings as it lowered itself, feet first, to the ground. As the alien ship's engines whined to a stop, she squeezed Zephram's arm, and he looked back at her, suddenly decades younger than the day they had met. The ones known as Will and Geordi stepped forward and took Zeph gently by the arm. Doctor, you're on. Zeph stared at them, perfectly sober, drunk with awe. My God, they're really from another world. Will smiled in his easy manner, and they're going to want to meet the man who flew that warp ship. A hatch in one of the landing claws began slowly to open. Light spilled out, illuminating the night air. Three hooded figures emerged, robed in elegant patterned brocades of charcoal, bronze, aubergine. One of the taller ones pulled back its hood, and at that instant, Lily ceased struggling against tears and permitted them to course down her cheeks. It was a man, 
a handsome man with a strong jaw, strong cheekbones. If the stark lighting did not deceive, his complexion had a decidedly greenish cast. But it was the ears that made her realize, yes, this is a man, but it is most definitely not a human being. Slowly, regally, with remarkable and formal composure, the group's leader walked over to Cochran and raised a hand, palm out. Zeph mimicked the gesture, adding an uncertain smile and a little wave. The alien indulged in neither, but spoke in flawless, unaccented English. Live long and prosper. From the nearby shadows, Lily heard Picard's voice. I think it's time for us to make a discreet exit. Riker nodded. Riker to Enterprise, stand by to beam us up. He, Dr. Crusher, and LaForge moved deeper into the shadows. Picard stepped to the edge of the light and smiled at Lily. She walked up to him. I envy you, the world you're going to. An amused look came over his face. I envy you, taking these first steps into a new frontier. I'll miss you, Lily. She smiled as he clasped her hands, and then she forced herself to walk away into the blazing lights, but staying close enough to hear his voice. The card to Enterprise, energize. Lily knew she would never see any of them again. Even so, she could not resist staring up into the night sky. Aboard the Enterprise E, now gratifyingly back to normal, Picard looked upon his bridge and his senior crew. He felt appreciation for the future that awaited them, and all who had helped bring it to pass. Report, Mr. Worf. The moon's gravitational field obscured our warp signature. The Vulcans did not detect us. Geordi looked up from his console. I've reconfigured our warp field to match the chronometric readings of the Borg sphere. Recreate the vortex, Commander. Data half turned from his station, most of his face still silver. Helm standing by. Lay in a course for the 24th century, Mr. Data. Something tells me our future will be there waiting for us. Course laid in, sir. Picard permitted himself the faintest of smiles. Make it so. And in the unseasonably warm Montana night, Lily Sloan stood just outside the crash and burn, staring up at the sky. There she saw what she'd been waiting for, a flash of rainbow light and a tiny star sailing inside it, abruptly vanishing into the future. She smiled and took a step back to peer inside the tent, where Zeph was standing near the jukebox, waving his arms and talking a light year a minute. He was far too excited to touch the glass he'd poured for himself. Suddenly he reached out and, grinning broadly, hit a control on the jukebox. Each Vulcan lifted his or her right eyebrow, then listened with perfectly detached scientific curiosity. Lily could not help but laugh delightedly along with the other settlers. The phoenix had risen at last. And she was never coming down. Star Trek First Contact was written by J.M. Dillard and read by Gates McFadden. It was abridged for audio by George Truitt. The recording engineer was Jeff Thomas at Village Recorders. Editing by Steven Strassman. Music mix and post-production by Eric Foreman. Sound design by Gary Fink. Original music was composed by Carl Schertz, Dave Kersner, Eve Baglarian, Carl Sharif, Richard Heyman, Sam McCauley, and Richard Emmett. 
The theme music from the Star Trek television series was composed by Alexander Courage and Gene Roddenberry and used courtesy of Bruin Music. The associate producer was Sloan Seaman. Star Trek First Contact was produced and directed by Carol Shapiro. This has been a presentation of Simon & Schuster Audio. Also available from Simon & Schuster Audio, J.M. Dillard's Star Trek Generations. Star Trek First Contact is available in book form from Pocket Books.